McCaskill. Let me also acknowledge the tens Claire McCaskill of claims Missouri victory in Missouri. We now have another category. We've had projected winners, apparent winners. Now we have another self-announced before the other guys conceded winner. First Jim Webb and now Claire McCaskill. We, there's no there's no concession from the from the Republican once, incumbent in either of these. Once upon a time, mm -hmm. there was a protocol. The candidate who was losing would concede defeat, make the phone call to the candidate who had won, and congratulate him or her. At which point the candidate would say thank you for your magnanimity and proceed to the hall and accept victory. In Virginia tonight, we have no indication whatever that George Allen called up uh, Jim Webb and said, I've lost to you. He certainly didn't tell his troops that. So Webb proceeded unilaterally to declare victory. We just missed it here, but he did it. In this case, the same with Claire McCaskill. She declared victory. We haven't seen anything from Jim Talent to suggest he's given up. So. Once again, as politics deteriorates in this country, an old wonderful rule has gone by, which is you let your opponent who's losing say so first. This does beg the question, though, of what happens if either of them, especially Claire McCaskill, would be wrong. I mean, obviously, the Virginia thing is going to be recounted one way or the other. It's going to, and let's, let's put it this way, it's going to carry over into tomorrow morning. Right. We know that much. But is this, if you get this wrong, what happens? I mean, there's nothing. I, have, no, I they don't know. It's, it's like, the, it's like the old famous Chicago Tribune uh, headline that Dewey had won in 48, but that was a joke. It was a failure of, they jumped ahead of the news. Mm -hmm. Here you have the candidates jumping ahead of the news, and I guess you just save that as a joke for the next party fundraisers. Uh, of the other party, you've got a candidate claiming he'd won or she'd won and lost. Well, maybe we're looking at the wrong end of the telescope here, though, because with the Webb claim of victory in Virginia and the McCaskill claim of victory in Missouri, we are down to one Senate seat that decides who controls the Senate, and it's Conrad Burns versus well, let's, who cut John uh, that Tester. That brings us to the latest numbers, and here we are, John Tester, Democrat. According to these raw numbers, uh, it was 64 percent of the votes counted, 124,000 to 100. 15,000 roughly, uh, a narrow advantage, but a significant advantage. It's enough to win, obviously, tonight in these close races. Uh, that won't be a recount situation. These are small states. This is a small state, Montana. So uh, you are right, sir, uh, Keith, if it Montana goes, Missouri yes. goes, Virginia goes, that's three plus three, they go. They yeah, win. It could be as Montana goes, so goes the nation. Well, does that not segue us perfectly into our next three guests? Brian Williams of NBC Nightly News, Tom Brokaw, anchor emeritus of NBC Nightly News and something of an expert on the region, and of course Tim Russert, NBC Washington bureau chief and moderator of Meet the Press. And, and uh, Tom, let's start with you. As Montana goes, so goes the nation, perhaps? Uh, that could very well be the case in the uh, Montana Senate race. I'd like to know what counties are still out. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the topography of Montana, Yellowstone County is Billings, the biggest town. That's Conrad Burns territory uh, conventionally. The Tester people thought they were doing pretty well there. Gallatin County is over uh, where Brian Williams likes to run around a dirt track on a <laughs> fast car. Uh, and that's Bozeman. Uh, those two counties are uh, big movers and shakers in Montana politics. So we'll see what happens. It's going to take about 240,000 votes to win this probably because they always get a very high voter turnout. Everybody expected it to be very close. The tester people thought that they had closed quickly yesterday and were doing well. And the exit polling shows that tester was doing well among males and females better than, um, than uh, Conrad Burns. That should be a strong indication for him, but this one is up for grabs. Tim, give us your read on this, uh, the, the uh, extraordinary scenario of this campaign and the, uh, the Conrad Burns might be the first senator ever defeated by the YouTube website. Is that, uh, is that in, in prospect now, serious prospect? Absolutely. Uh, it is not only the things that he said, uh, but also his relationship with Jack Abramoff, uh, the now uh, convicted lobbyist from Washington. Uh, Keith, the ir irony in all this, of course, is if Conrad Burns loses and the Democrats recapture control of the Senate for the first time since 1994, the new chairman of the Senate Finance Committee will be Democrat Max Baucus of Montana. <laughs> <laughs> so he who giveth taketh away and vice versa. Uh, it is quite striking as we sit here now at 2 o'clock in the morning uh, contemplating the real possibility that the Democrats could get this trifecta, Missouri, Virginia, and Montana, and control both houses of Congress for the first time since 1994 and the Republican Revolution of Newt Gingrich. 
But uh, Brian Williams, what happened with the the protocol that uh, that, that uh, Chris was just talking about? Where where are the uh, where are the alternative points of view from Missouri? We already heard one from Virginia. What happened to that idea that? Uh, Gee whiz, you let the, uh, the, the person who you think lost go first. Well, that's the thing. You know, Frank Capra doesn't write these. And uh, <laughs> Frank Capra never wrote a script where, at the end, lawyers come in. Uh, and they come in on Gulfstream 4s with uh, beautiful shoes and briefcases. So a lot of this isn't going to go according to Hoyle. Uh, there were so many scenarios tonight. Who had it that at the end of the night, who predicted it of all the, the people in the blogosphere, print journalists, uh, that we'd be down to this kind of Republican yeah. firewall has become the term du jour to describe this protection. All that remains between Republican and Democratic control of the U.S. Senate. What a storyline tonight. And Tim, Brian just used the term firewall relative to the Montana race, which might in fact be decided by how Conrad Burns, uh, in some part anyway, Conrad Burns characterized visiting firefighters. The ironies <laughs> just pile upon each other. And on and on and on. And think about Missouri, Keith, and what is deciding that? Uh, stem cell research, embryonic stem cell research, huge role, Michael J. Fox yep. and Rush Limbaugh, a native son of Missouri. Yep. And think about Virginia uh, in Macaca uh, by, by uh, George Allen. Uh, it is fascinating how these moments during this campaign uh, may have, in fact, shaped the outcome of history if, in fact, the Senate flips. Let me ask you all, were you all as taken as I was by the uh, really classy to use a Sinatra term, a classy a concession by uh, Harold Ford Jr. tonight. Hey. I was, so, and it wasn't exactly a full confession. It was, I lost this race, but I'm coming back. Chris, I'll go first because I, I snuck a listen. I have a little, uh, I can listen in one ear. I have this little device I put up to my ear. It looks like I'm going to call Thelma Lou in Mayberry, but it, it works very well. And uh, I did hear some of that speech. I heard the part exactly where he talked about getting Potomac fever at the ripe old age of four and how that district, in his words, took a chance on him at 25. We just went down there last week, spent some time with him. Uh, we got some flack, of course, for locating the broadcast in the largest city in Tennessee, which, oh, by the way, is is Harold Ford's uh, political center. We we did it, of course, not for reasons of, of bias or to throw the broadcast in his direction. The report we aired was completely balanced, but it was, as speeches went tonight, uh, one of the more interesting, and I, I'll, I'll say nothing beyond that. Tim, did you hear the open door there to another race, perhaps for the other Senate seat at some point? Oh, absolutely. And I think that's an interesting piece of this story tonight. Although Harold Ford Jr. did not win, although Mike, or Michael Steele and Maryland didn't win, was the emergence of these extraordinarily competent and attractive African-American candidates of both parties, coupled with the emergence of Barack Obama as a very credible presidential candidate. And so it's an important change and advancement and evolution in our politics and what I think we'll remember in 2006. I thought it was great just as an observer and as an American to see that the, uh, the electoral, the uh, polling in Tennessee turned out to be pretty predictive. Unlike in the case of the Doug Water race where we had an African-American predicted by polls to be 13 points ahead in that Virginia governor's race and winning by one. The two times to Tom Bradley, the commissioner, police commissioner of uh, Los Angeles losing races he was predicted by the pollsters to win. This time, people were at least true to themselves. They voted the way that they talked to the pollsters. They weren't playing any games out there. I assume the white voters were speaking the way to the pollsters they intended to vote, and they were faithful to their own account of how they're going to vote. That is some progress, I think. Well, it sure Chris, is. It's, it's also very generational, obviously. I mean, the two cases that you cite, Doug Wilder and Tom Bradley, uh, we're counting on voters who uh, were already mature by the time the civil rights vote uh, mm. was taken. You now have a whole generation of voters who have grown up with a much more integrated society and they see on television commercials and work for African Americans, men and women in the workplace and see them in a whole different role model. So I think mm. that is part of the rising tide. By the way, I was surprised to hear that. I thought this was a defibrillator in case, <laughs> in case I went down with a heart attack. Well, that was good news. I think all of us agree. I think it's like uh, 
And in the words of uh, George Jefferson, uh, and the Jeffersons were all moving a little on up here. But, Tim, you know, you talked about all those opportunities that uh, the party, mainly the Republican Party, have given to African Americans. Uh, but nobody won. Here it comes. We have news right now. Let's take a look right now. I think we may have a card coming up here right now. Okay. Claire McCaskill, uh, here it is. Uh, oh, NBC oh, wow. News uh, projects when all the votes are counted in the state of Missouri that the winner will be Claire McCaskill, the Democratic challenger, defeating a very uh, strong, uh, resistance, defiant uh, re-election campaign by Jim Town, a man who had no, as someone said, had no firing offenses this year, did nothing wrong, had no uh, severe constituency problems like uh, Rick Santorum had in Pennsylvania, and nonetheless went down before this wave. And Jim Talon has just conceded this, so this is more than just a projection here. This is also now the Republican, the Republican well, Party. We're getting it done saying. somewhat out of order right now. Tim? Well, now it's, there, then there were two, Ooh. Montana and uh, Virginia. Virginia. And if, in fact, those trends hold, you could decide the fate of the United States Senate with 3,000 voters in the state of Virginia out of more than 2 million cast. This is extraordinary. Uh, but it really does give an awful lot of credence to that notion that vote turnout really does matter. And all that energy and all that money and all those attempts to try to galvanize the support uh, clearly is being reflected tonight. It really is important, as we could see in the next uh, a couple hours. It's quite a recruitment effort by Chuck Schumer, I must say. Chuck went out and found uh, the Senator from New York, the chairman of the campaign committee, went out and found an interesting group of people, a pro-choice uh, man from a beloved family in Pennsylvania, Bobby Casey Jr. He found a man of tremendous military uh, 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 accomplishment and commendability, uh, uh, Jim Webb in Virginia, a man right out of the military, almost a John Warner type, uh, another former Secretary of, of the Navy. And then he found a guy with a crew cut up in uh, Montana, Tom. I wonder if uh, Chuck Schumer is going to be on the lookout for more guys with those uh, well, I flat think, tops. I think that uh, Chuck Schumer deserves a lot of credit. I'm not sure that in the Webb and in the Tester case that he gets all the credit for that. There was some resistance to the idea. You remember Webb had a primary. And, That's true. Uh, and the, and the party leaders were divided about whether and, Webb was so the right Tester. guy. So did right. Tester. And so did Tester have a primary. And in fact, he was thought not to be the strongest candidate going in. Uh, so, but Schumer did a phenomenal job of raising money and uh, getting around the country as he always does. He lives and breathes this stuff. So this was a clash of titans. Carl right. Rove yeah. against uh, Schumer <laughs> and Rahm Emanuel. Hey, uh, hey uh, Chris and Keith, I just had a thought, though. If, in fact, uh, Tester and Webb both win, and it's 51-49, what happens if Joe Lieberman says, you know what? Oh, boy. Maybe, oh, yeah. I, oh. maybe I really am going to align myself with the other party and become chairman. No, and I'm just kidding, but it's something to think about. And Chris, one final <laughs> thought. Look, uh, look, Chris, it would be so much like Joe Lieberman, <laughs> too. I'm sorry. Chris, Brian. one final thought to look for the official coronation in the media this coming week of Rahm Emanuel. He's the subject of a long takeout in the current issue of Fortune magazine. Goes into great detail on his family, the infection that robbed him of most of a digit, his years in the Israeli Defense Forces, uh, his years as a, a, a a, a, a ballet student, um, he is going to be really lionized, I think, for the effort he put in on the House side for the Democratic Party. So there will be, uh, if you're a profile writer, television correspondent in Washington, these will be uh, happy days, no shortage of work. I called him up last week and I said, okay, what's the number going to be? And he said 26, yeah. and I think he, that's how far he had gotten. But I really do think something ballooned over the weekend. Something drove this much higher than that number, and uh, it was a hard one to kind of figure when it got late. Hard to figure this one. Yeah, one of the worst uh, developments from this uh, this cycle will be the new robocalls. Mm. Uh, they uh, had the most corrosive effect on the American household. Most people have an arm's length relationship with campaigning. You can toss the direct mail, you can turn off or mute the television. 
but when your phone rings seven to eight times because it's been programmed to ring if it is hung up before it reaches 30 seconds and it turns out to be all for a purpose of slamming a specific candidate or party that's as they said in the godfather a dirty business okay. and, uh, and and people will draw the line there it's a tough thing to get your arms around and legislate but that has angered a lot of people this session thanks a lot brian williams tim russert and tom brokoster you know it's interesting that tonight we're reporting on all the results and the only one who has shown in that entire presidential field is hillary and mccain mm -hmm. john edwards not to be heard from tonight nowhere out there mitt romney not to be heard from tonight rudy Giuliani, i didn't see him tonight where are all those people they didn't play a big role in tonight's election night. They were out in the field. They didn't make a point to show up tonight. I found it interesting. Well, uh, the, the whole 2008 field and, and what is to be expected from it has changed tonight because we're not going into the end of, a, of an eight-year one-party rule in Washington. Now it's a totally different playing field. Who will emerge? Who are the Democrats' leaders now that they have at least the House and maybe the Senate as well? As well? How will that change their dynamic? And what kind of what kind of hamstringing of right. the president, of a Republican president, will there be, and how would that okay. trail over into the next I'll Republican I'll get a new candidate. one for you, Keith. Yeah? If the Democrats win those two other Senate seats and the requisite number to take control in the U.S. Senate, there is a prize waiting for a Democrat to be majority leader of the U.S. Senate, a prize that wasn't available a day ago, a prize perhaps Hillary Clinton would like. She has an option now. She doesn't have to run for president. She can be the leader of her party in the Congress. Mm. That's not a bad role for someone in their second term. Not a bad role for someone who would have to risk all to run for president, but would have it all right now if she cuts the deal, as we've heard so often, is available to her with Harry Reid and take control of the Senate. As you suggest, uh, the entire playing field will change, not just in terms of the next two years, but as 2008 approaches and who runs, who doesn't, and what is available to them now. What is the, is the power now sufficient for the aspirations of these individual Democrats? Well, I believe we'll have our first woman president when she can be the leader of a parliament first, rather than have to run as an individual in a kind of a John Wayne commander in chief role. Therefore, Hillary can become leader of this country if she becomes leader of the Senate and people get used to her as the leader of a party, in effect, leader of the country and its legislative branch. Over time, they'll get used to the idea of her as president to just quit the legislative branch without having become a leader and taking yourself before the American people and say, make me your leader. That is a big jump in history. Well, with Senator-elect McCaskill in Missouri, we now have 16 women in the Senate. And speaking, uh, we are now down probably, at least from the Democratic point of view, we're down to Montana and we may get a call on that. The governor of that state saying Tester Burns will be called in the next half hour. A spokesman for Conrad Burns campaign saying the race is definitely tightening, admitting that the Democratic challenger John Tester is leading in Yellowstone County. The Republicans have to win that to win statewide. It may come down to Yellowstone County in Montana to determine if the Democrats take the Senate as well as the House. That is what we're going to be following after this next break, Chris. It's, uh, you got to get out your map quest. Well, it's good enough. It's now one thing to look at. at least Who would have believed that we'd go this far? It looks like it's going to be in the high one, high 230s for the Republican seats in the House and maybe 51 seats in the Senate, enough to overrule Vice President Cheney, no matter how hard he tries. Unless Joe Lieberman agrees with him, remember. Will you stop? <laughs> you, are, you are fishing in troubled waters here. Joe Lieberman says he will be a Democrat. Russert agreed with me on that point. Well, anyway, we're going to look at Montana. We're going to keep our eye on that ball when we continue. Decision 2006 continues here on MSNBC. Please stay with us. MSNBC. Keith Olbermann's special comment. One thing is certain. When Keith talks, people listen. Only on Countdown. Only on MSNBC. Chris, don't you think if Montana goes Democratic after Missouri went Democratic and it's now Virginia and a possible recount, that if, if they have to pay, no matter what they have to pay, doesn't the Republican Party have to go in for a recount in Virginia no matter what happens here, even yeah, if it doesn't look likely? I also think, uh, you know, people who... Uh, who have committed themselves to the big time in politics, like George Allen, are not going to get down easy. I mean, his whole plan was to be president within a couple of years. You know, he and his wife, I think, were headed for the big time, and they had a very good shot, uh, because if they'd gotten past this election clean, which they have not done that, they would have found themselves in a very short list of Republican. You know, John McCain's 
has to think about whether he's going to run for president. Rudy Giuliani has not decided to run. Mitt Romney will run. George Allen had a good shot against Mitt mm -hmm. Romney and the others. And I think it's easy to say, uh, you know, throw in the towel. But when your whole career goes between you're finished and you might be president someday, although I have to say now, after this very r uh, ragged campaign, I don't think George Allen's presidential material right now. You'd have to hope that people would forget this whole mess he went through with the macaque and the rest of it. They're not likely to do that. But I think that... Uh, you know, it's very hard to quit. I, am, I will go back to this. I am so impressed by uh, young Harold Ford Jr.'s ability to take it. Mm -hmm. And maybe being young allows him to take it because he knows intuitively at 36 he can come back another couple of times and, uh, and, and go after Lamar Alexander when he comes up for re-election or hope that he will re retire. Uh, he has a good shot at the future right now. Let's go back to Missouri, where Claire McCaskill's uh, evident victory, certainly evident uh, both from the projections, from all the numbers that are there, from the, ah, from there the concession of the, uh, huh. of the incumbent senator, she won. Jim Talent. Uh, <laughs> she'll be going to the Senate from, uh, from Missouri. Uh, congratulations. Thanks for your time tonight. Thank you. Uh, we, I would think people nationally know this campaign based on that Michael J. Fox commercial and the subsequent extraordinary reaction, overreaction to it in many quarters. Do you think that was pivotal in this or was it just a component in what happened for you in Missouri uh, today? It was just one piece of the, the campaign. Uh, the national media certainly made uh, a lot of it, but here on the ground, it was more about Iraq. It was about change. It was about accountability and health care. I will say this, though. Rush Limbaugh's reaction to the Michael J. Fox ad certainly helped raise me a lot of money, and I'm very grateful to him for that. <laughs> well, there's an old rule I'd like to coin in politics. Uh, don't pick on somebody your size. Pick on somebody bigger than you. Picking on Rush Limbaugh, just like you pick on Bill O'Reilly all the time, time isn't a isn't a, not a, a it's a pretty good strategy you pick on somebody that has a lot of, of fans obviously but also a lot of critics that does drum up interest in you well I, and I think the whole thing did raise the profile of the race but it's great to have you on congratulations Claire McCaskill you've beaten you a guy much. who had no firing offenses you still beat him uh, you picked the race and you won it congratulations in the middle of the country Thank Missouri you. has turned Democratic uh, Keith that is the bellwether state. Yeah, and uh, we heard the Baker Commission referenced again as the again, possible as, as possible. Again, we heard it from Rahm Emanuel earlier. The, the face-saving mechanism to get us collectively, this country, out of the the mess of Iraq, and uh, there it was from the what do we call uh, for the presumptive senator elect? Is that the technical term the right lady now? Lady, you just claimed yeah, victory. That's right. That's her. <laughs> and I'm just thinking as we've been going through all the math, for some reason, Carl Rove's words come to mind here about uh, you are entitled to your math and I'm entitled to the math. I don't know what it's that the, means. It's the new math tonight. I'm impressed. What a nice person she seems to mm -hmm. be. And she won. The race wasn't that dirty. Some of the others were dirtier. I can tell you watching them across the country. And uh, the, the president's got to deal with that. What we just heard, a confident person with the mandate of the people behind her in, a, in the swing state of the union, mm -hmm. the president can't ignore that. And now the swing state in the union is Montana. Nora are extremely optimistic. And in fact, uh, a spokesperson for John Tester, the Democrat, said, I think we've got this one. Uh, and presumably could try and work out some sort of power sharing arrangement. So it's an interesting scenario, really, either way. Now, it's interesting how uh, Joe Lieberman's going to identify. I believe, although he's elected as an independent, I believe he's going to try to win full admission to the caucus, uh, whereas the other fellow, Bernie Sanders, takes pride in being an independent, a self-described socialist, in fact. He likes being out there on his own. Is the Lieberman thing going to be like the end of Moby Dick, where the seas consume what has well, happened during I, this year and there's nothing there's no sign of any discord there's yes. nothing no, left but no. Ishmael and, to tell and, the tale and interestingly enough Keith already today before they declared Senator Joe Lieberman the winner in Connecticut as an independent there was talk up on Capitol Hill among the Democrats that they were going to try and deny Joe Lieberman if they won the majority the chairmanship of um, the um, which committee is it? John Homeland Carwitz Security. Security. Me? Yeah. No, no, not Armstrong. House Security. Government yeah, Reform and Oversight. Yeah, yeah. House Government Reform and Oversights. Right. Uh, it's not going to happen, Nora. I mean, if, if we have the Senate, Democrats have the Senate 51 49, we're not going to get rid of the guy who could then go over mm -hmm. to the other side mm -hmm. and they would control the Senate again. So I think sure. what's going to happen is pe Keith is exactly right. 
Uh, the, it's, the waves are going to wash it away. He's going to be welcome back into the Democratic Party. Right, because in Washington, everything's always hunky dory. <laughs> oh, Keith. Hey, Chris. I've got to turn it over to Keith. Some voice got in my ear and said, turn it over to Keith. So, All right. Keith. Well, you, but when have you listened to the voice? I, I try to observe the uh, choreography of this discussion. Look, as we've much got as right, what do we got right now? We've got a de we've got a, uh, a Republican administration. We've got a, a Democratic uh, House. We've got what looks like what could still be an absolute flat-footed tie in the Senate. We've got you listening to the voices in your And we have the Democratic Party. Every conversation we've had tonight, we've been successful. John, let me make a point, and then I'll throw it to you. It seems to me that all the interviews tonight add up to a couple of themes. They aren't just uh, the president's quite comfortable where he stands even with the loss of the Senate, I bet. So it's going to be interesting to see if the president does say, OK, I'll listen to Jimmy Baker and Lee Hamilton, and I might go along with some of their program, their pro proposal. But the Democrats don't yet this moment, as of tonight, mm -hmm. have the fiber to offer a clear-cut alternative to this president. It's so obvious. Did you interviewed When you interviewed Ken Melman, did you not hear a hand coming out a little bit from, from outside the sleeve, a, 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 some sort of gesture there, at least in tone that suggested well, there was somebody who was going to negotiate? to elicit that, to seduce that, if you will, by saying, how can you have a political settlement in Iraq under our governance and our uh, sponsorship if we don't have a political settlement here in the United States first? And he's, he kept claiming his lack of uh, competence in that area, that he couldn't negotiate such a, a question. But in fact, it is a political question here at home. There but, has to be a political so, solution so, here before there. So it is now a question of, of who is, and again, we, we used this before, the race towards bipartisanship who right. makes that first formal gesture and i don't you know i i'm sorry i can't imagine that the scheduling of those news conferences uh, nancy pelosi what nine hours from now and then the president ten hours from now i don't know that that's coincidental it may be a race to be who can be well, the nicest Keith, Keith, first. i have to tell you this has been fun tonight in a bipartisan sense in a bipartisan sense i listen sense. to your commentaries i get the point of view that you offer up after all the newscasts each night and i find it very uh, Bracing <laughs> and, uh, and provocative. Word. How's that for a non a non I don't. You're sounding like a Democratic candidate you know, tonight. No, I find your views very informative in the tradition of Eric Severide. Although you are not, as a bartender friend of mine I once said, an Eric several sides. <laughs> you have one clear side, and I think that's informative. And I think in all the world we work in, it's always good to have a provocation because it makes people think. And you are as good as Edward R. Murrow at that sort of thing. And I appreciate it. You are a great writer, a great partner tonight. We've never done this before. It was fun doing this with you. But we're going to take a long time, I think at least a couple of weeks, to absorb what happened tonight. I think this was a strong, powerful mm -hmm. bombardment of the establishment tonight, a powerful punch at the way things have been going. Or a punch on behalf of the history establishment, the, the historical idea that there need to be checks and balances, that, that, that wonderful idea of, of, of the weights resting on each other to make sure no one has unilateral control has been emphasized right now again. It's a it's a Republican administration. It's a Democratic right. House. It's a tied Senate until we hear further from Montana. And some and night, Virginia. maybe not this one, we'll see the fruition of what looked to me tonight as the beginning of the recovery of the conservative party by conservative thinking. Hmm. Pat should be happy. <laughs> I leave you with something here. We'll be uh, following up on all this tomorrow on Countdown, obviously, when I return to the set. But in the interim, I'm leaving you a couple of donuts to get through the next couple of hours. I, I, I will, they my, will work. My final hour. gift to you. Thank Thank you. Thank you. And goodbye. And goodbye. I think we're going to be get more involved with the panel as we should. They were a brilliant panel, as you've been seeing all night. It has changed. It has, more, it has morphed into a group of Nora, fresh as a daisy, Pat Buchanan, ready to fight, Bob Shrum, still hoping for a carry recount at this point. <laughs> uh, it might still be there out there in Ohio. Now that you got rid of Ken Blackwell, who you've been, you've been stalking now for two years, you finally got rid of him. And John, Hard John Hardwood, a man with hard numbers. John Hardwood. We'll be right back with this panel. Let's go right now to my friend uh, David Schuster. He's down by phone. I guess we've lost the camera. We're operating on limited budget now. But David, thank you for joining us. You're still down there in Richmond. What do you hear is happening in that Senate race? 
Well, Chris, a couple of things. Yeah, we lost the camera at 4.30 <laughs> in the morning, but um, no. And come daylight, uh, both uh, Jim Webb and George Allen are going to get a better at least picture of, uh, of where the votes may be that they could be missing. Uh, as it stands, the spread now is obviously around 10 or 11,000 votes, uh, Jim Webb with the lead. This is largely the result of absentee ballots that they continue to uh, to count through the night. What's going to happen come daylight is both campaigns have lawyers that are going to go across the state and be part of what's known as a canvassing. And that's simply where they will double-check and make sure that the arithmetic was accurate, that the tickers from the electronic voting machines were uh, accurate, that the right numbers were called into the Secretary of the State of the Board of the Elections. And they'll go through and essentially double-check all of the numbers. Uh, by the end of the day, at that point, uh, the web campaign should have a better idea whether, in fact, there's potential for them to make up uh, the 10 or 11,000 votes. In other words, they may discover that there was a massive computer glitch or that numbers were added incorrectly or that for whatever reason votes were not counted. If that's the case, then obviously that increases the likelihood that once the election is certified 10 days from now, then the Allen campaign would say, yeah, we want to recount, knowing that there's some votes there that could make a big difference. On the other hand, if in this canvassing tomorrow it becomes clear that the official count uh, provided uh, last evening was accurate, that there wasn't some major computer glitch, uh, then it becomes sort of a whole new ball game. a question of, you know, can you figure out some way of making up 10,000 votes if it doesn't appear that those votes exist for you? Have there been any claims by the... Uh by the Allen campaign that there have been irregularities or failures to count accurately? No, the, uh, the Allen campaign now uh, is not sure. I mean, they're just saying, look, we just need to go back and do the canvassing that's warranted under state law and, uh, and go back and see. But there haven't been any accusations really on either side, uh, Chris, that there was either any major sort of computer glitch or that the math was done improperly or that there was some number that wasn't counted. There is one issue, though, that has come up with both campaigns, and that is apparently a large number of military absentee ballots were either never mailed to military bases or that people who are from Virginia who wanted to vote or were serving in the military, for whatever reason, they didn't get their ballots or they weren't faxed properly. So that's a whole Well, if you thing. haven't voted, you can't make a claim to have the right to subsequently vote, can you? Well, yes and no. Uh, you, you can't, but there's something called a provisional ballot, which, for example, at the polls, if you go to the polls, yes, you're not... Yes, but they had to have, uh, uh, had to have claimed those uh, provisional ballots on Election Day. You must vote on Election Day, right, or earlier. That's right. You must vote on Election Day. I think the issue is, is there some sort of issue with provisional ballots, say, um, at, you know, one of the military bases in Virginia. Remember, you're talking about, you know, you know I think 750,000 um, um, military veterans and, and certainly a large number of active duty in Virginia. So there's some question about people who are in active duty military. How did they get their ballots in on Election Day if they did? Okay, David, I think I can say goodnight to you now, can I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can say goodnight, and we'll, we'll be back up in just a couple of hours. I think we're going to Morse code next after the phones have failed. But anyway, thank you, David. Just you're a great reporter. Here's a Thanks, look at some Chris. notable losers tonight. I'm going to read these boards. It's always brutal, but here we go. Late in the morning now. It's almost 5 o'clock now. Let's take a look at some of these losers. I'm looking down here. I can look up as well. Here they People here in Connecticut today, and I believe across the country, are sending a message to leaders of both major political parties. Yes, they want change, but they don't want change in just who runs Congress. They want change in how we run the country. Good evening. I'm Chris Matthews. In fact, it's not evening. We're still waiting on two races to decide who will control the Senate. At this hour, NBC News reports that the race is in Montana. Between Conrad Burns and John Tester, and in Virginia, between George Allen, the incumbent, and, and Jim Webb, the challenger, are still too close to call. Let's look at some of the other big winners of the night. Right now, that's John Tester and, and, and Conrad Burns, as I said, are too close to call, although you can see the numbers there. And we may have a result there in a couple of hours right now. That's uh, Montana. And here we have, in Virginia, the same, a very close race. Although Jim Webb did declare victory there a couple of hours ago, we're not uh, moving ahead with any projection yet on that race final projection. But 
There are signs here, without getting uh, too official about it, that uh, John Tetzer's in good shape up there in Montana, as is Jim Webb down in Virginia. And the Democrats, because of those uh, situations, are in very good shape right now. In fact, I would say a plurality of betting odds right now that they're going to win this thing, win the Senate right now. Too close to cause, I said, in, uh, in Montana. But this is uh, good news for the Democrats. They went through a shaky weekend. Craig Crawford joining us now from Congressional Court. They went through a shaky weekend with a lot of ups and downs and jiggling in those polls and, uh, and uh, certainly a comeback of some kind for Conrad Burns that looked like a comeback and yeah. it may have dissolved during the voting day itself. Yeah. And in uh, Virginia, there was talk of a, of a uh, George Allen comeback as well, which may well have dissolved in the late vote, in the late count coming out of uh, Fairfax County. Amazing, huh, for the Democrats? I mean, almost every race that was close, they managed to win, it looks like. Amazing for the Democrats, and I tell you, Chris, I've been thinking a lot about George Bush tonight. I, I, I've written a weekly column well, on this. Well, he's been asleep since 9.30, I mean, so for, you're for, thinking for, for both two of years, you. Two years, I've written a weekly <laughs> column on this White House and, uh, and, and tracked you know, the politics of this White House over that time. And yeah, while this was about Iraq, this, I think, will go down in history as one of the most politically incompetent second terms in presidential history. I mean, just forget about Iraq. Look at how he started this term, uh, talking about Social Security overhaul. Even his own party didn't want that. Uh, then they intervened in the Terry Shavo, uh, Shavo, Sh case. Shavo case, the comatose Florida woman. Uh, um, then you have immigration, uh, which uh, was not something his party wanted. Uh, and then he ended with vetoing uh, stem cell, the, the effort to ban, uh, withdraw his restrictions on, on stem cell research. Uh, all these things uh, undermined his own party. Uh, this president wanted John Kerry's apology. I think he owes an apology to his own party. And, I, and we've talked a lot about the pre president needing to deal with the Democrats. Before he does that, he's got to deal with his own party. There's going to be a lot of anger. At, you think the knives are out in your party, Ben? Uh, I think there's going to be a period of introspection coming up here. Um, I'm not sure that the knives are out quite so much for the president because he has, after all, done a lot to get to the, the party to where it is. And he's been elected twice. He brought home the congressional wing in 2002 in an election that nobody thought they were going to be able to do. Now, I don't so see he how he gets a pass. A how does amount. he get a pass? I mean, well, he's I the think, president. I don't think he I gets mean, they're going to focus on Carl Rove. But Rowe it's and... not. But the dynamics are changing because if you don't have the majority in Congress, then a lot of the natural conflicts that have occurred between the president and the legislative branch aren't going to. The president also is not on the ballot again. I think to the extent that there's a conflict in the party, it'll be in some leadership elections that have sort of taken flight uh, in about the last three hours. That's right. And when the House decides to postpone its leadership elections, the Republicans in the House, till December instead of holding them in November, there's going to be some, some intra-party battling. And there will be for some of the other offices in the Senate below Mitch McConnell. Well, why blame uh, Reynolds or... Uh, or Denny Hastert or Boehner or any of the leaders for what happened in this election. It looks like this was all foreign policy caused. Well, I'm not sure that it was all foreign policy caused. I mean, I think you can't underestimate the way the members in the House feel about the Foley scandal and the way the, the leadership handled it. And I think that, in, in part, is going to fuel what, uh, what goes on in the House. Yeah, I, the Senate I, is a matter of there are now vacancies because of uh, Senator Santorum's loss. Well, the, they're in the leadership ranks. In the leadership ranks. Who's going to fill that? Do you, excuse me. Who's going to fill that? Because well, you've got uh, Trent Lott showing an interest in perhaps getting back in into the number two slot yeah. behind Mitch McConnell. But then uh, I hear that Delar Lamar Alexander's Lamar Alexander looking at it. And John Kyle, who just won a, a pretty convincing victory in a tough environment. Uh, is also in line. Really? Yeah. Really? Yes. I think the um, the problem that there the voters clearly talked about corruption in the exit polling, and so how the Congress is run is going to be an issue. Okay, fair it's enough. something that Nancy Pelosi, I think, is paying a lot of attention to. They've talked about um, dealing with corruption and lobbying reform as one of their top three things. That the Democrats are going to do when they, when they reconvene the House, I do think that whenever you have a loss like this, that the Republican campaign committee leadership, that you know the the, uh, the Senate leadership, they're all going to be um, uh, knives out. But that changes Another key, anyways. That's a changing key issue, anyways. though, in Republican blame is going to be this sort of stay the course and divide the um, country and appeal to the base 
politics of Karl Rove, whether that strategy no, is, is going to stick. This is what bugs me. Is, I agree, Karl Rove. This isn't Wait, Karl Rove. No, no, no. It's George Bush. Well, I mean, George fine, fine, Bush fine. is the president. But Why do we always try to focus on Karl Rove? I mean, well, I agree, Karl enough, Rove. But regardless, but, but it's I mean, their strategy. I, 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 let, I, let me finish why my point. Why does George Bush escape blame? Well, he, why, he, why does he, everybody explain that away? He has responsibility, no question. I mean, we say but this election was about Iraq. That was his decision. The that issue was George is whether Bush. the Republican election, he's this, the this election because was a referendum not, on George because, Bush. Because he's not on the ballot again. The, the, no, he was on this ballot. He was on this ballot. He was on this ballot. But he's ballot. not on 2008. If he wasn't on the ballot, why was he out there campaigning? He was campaigning? on it for this one. Wait a second, okay, guys. Wait, 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 wait. Let's reset the table. We started this conversation with I want you to reset the table first. You're writing a paragraph about what just happened in American politics the last 24 hours. Starting the, yesterday morning, a sixth year of a presidency, the Democrats win big, big takeover of the House, probable now takeover of the Senate. Write the paragraph on why that happened. You have a president who was as firm as he could be on his strategy and his course and did not listen to people in his That's party a, or well, the American people. You have to be people. a little more colorizing here. <laughs> I would say he, he stuck was, to his guns on wait, the wait, war. Wait, wait. I would he say stuck to his guns on the war, didn't listen, and his party in the Congress went along with him lock, step, and barrel, even when their leadership expressed doubt. I, I and say they he are was, all paying the price together he was, for he him was, tonight. He was, he, was, he was stubborn and delusional. I, I mean, I just And watched, his guys went along I, with I it. Just That's watched, the key issue, I just Craig. watched the, right. the Oliver Stone, Stone movie on Nixon, and, and I, I saw many parallels. <laughs> no, no, no. But may, the I, may I write the paragraph about Nixon. my party here? <laughs> the Republicans went south on Nixon. They didn't go south on George Bush. Write me a highly documented account of what happened in the last 24 hours. The Republican leadership has managed to anger the three prongs of the Republican base. The national security conservatives are angered about the war and the way it's being prosecuted. The fiscal conservatives are outraged about spending in the Congress and the administration's failure to veto any of the spending bills. And the social conservatives are absolutely aghast at the Foley scandal and the way it was handled. Therefore, all three prongs of what makes up the traditional Republican base have something to worry about. Now, that's not a rejection of conservative principles. That is the fact that Republicans strayed from those principles, but it's those the country as a whole is conservative. This is not an election that shows that the country has all of a sudden become liberal. What it showed is that Republicans looked sort of contradictory to their own principles okay. and independence rejected. When was the big chill? They, they when did you base. discover that? When, you know, the big show, you know, the movie, when I is it indeed. when you realize that... Those uh, are my people. You, that's right, that your party <laughs> went from being the revolutionary party of the contract with America and Newt Gingrich in 94 to becoming the party that cared more about power, earmarks, spending, uh, newsletters that it, said, look what I brought back to the district, that sort of thing. That kind of old, established politician. When did your party get old? I, I, think, it, I think it got crystallized with Katrina in which the party that is... That is historically good at or prides itself on being able to manage things didn't manage things well at all. I think it, it got exacerbated by the Abramoff scandals which got into the whole pork barrel earmark uh, problems that arose. I think it got continued with some of the legislative moves. Immigration was a divide amongst the party. Uh, and, and lastly, the Foley scandal, which, yeah. if anything, we should be protecting the children, but, but, and we failed but to again, do that. Why, why do you use the passive voice on that? These were, these were all George Bush's decisions wait a minute, and, and, and wait a minute, responsibility. Wait a minute. Abramoff was not no, no, a Bush no. problem. I mean, immigration. The, the, Im immigration, Im immigration and Katrina, get, social get security, laid, get laid, get laid at the doorstep. But we the wouldn't other even two, be talking about stem cell research if he hadn't made that the focus of his first televised address the before, other, before 9 11. Chris we wouldn't the, even be talking Chris about. Chris asked the question about when we became the party of earmarks, and the yeah. answer to that is that got crystallized over the Jack Abramoff scandal. That is not an administration problem. <laughs> Jack Abramoff is, was, I mean, he, no, he, he, it, it, he was working, he was working no, no. for this White the House. Problem, the, the problem the was a congressional problem. Sorry, the Republicans no. controlling <laughs> the White House and both houses of Congress created a, um, a, a, a level of corruption and intensity of, of, of power that had Democrats had never gone. They, the, the red face oh. test of, of what was okay to do and not okay to do in Washington just went out the window. But I maintain oh. that for all of George Bush's mistakes, and there were a lot of mistakes, the biggest mistake the Republicans made in Congress is when they knew 
that they were that he was wrong and when they disagreed with him that they went along with him anyway. Well, all, that's why the all Congress that's, all is I'm completely All I'm trying to say here is that tonight. I think the Republican Party is in good shape if they are the Republican Party and not the party of Bush. And when they figure that out yeah. and, and make him irrelevant, but, but the, he the is, Republican that's Party can history, survive. History makes him less and less relevant on the stage. This yeah. is much more about would, who can fix he, things. He not only in, is, in becomes a lame duck out of this, he's an invisible duck. Well, none of us will forget. I, well, I disagree with that, too. <laughs> you can't forget we're 1994. Gonna be, uh, we're going to be back on that point. Uh, <laughs> We're getting grouchy here, my friend. We'll be right back with what to what extent that George Bush deserves to. Well, he, let's face it, he's going to have to take the hit for this tomorrow. He's going to have to hold a press conference tomorrow at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And he's going to have to explain what he's going to do, given what looks to be the total collapse of his congressional party. We'll be right back to talk about it more as we reach toward the magic moment when uh, Don Imus shows up, which is almost like Santa Claus coming here. <laughs> of course, he's packing. That's the difference. We'll be right back. Senator Allen said not long ago when he uh, came on the news and said we all need to respect uh, the process in this country, the democratic process. Uh, we all go out, we vote, we argue, we vote. But also, we'd like to say that uh, the votes are in and we won. Well, there's Jim Webb, the Democratic challenger, claiming victory. We haven't given it to him yet at NBC. NBC has not projected him as the winner. That said, looking at all the evidence, he does have an edge now in the count, and uh, they're going to have to decide if that's enough of an edge to prevent a recount and to uh, lead to an acceptance and a concession speech by uh, George Allen. We're looking at these numbers, by the way, 1170564 to 1162, about 7,000 some votes. Uh, Let's take a look now. Katherine Harris has, of course, been an iconic figure in American life since the year 2000 recount, where she was so much identified with the Chads, et cetera, et cetera, and, of course, uh, iconized on whatever that word is on Saturday Night Live for so many times. Here she is conceding defeat in that Senate race. About an hour ago, I spoke with Senator Nelson, and I congratulated him, and I wished him well, and he was very gracious in return. I still believe, and I want everyone here to still believe, that public service is a noble calling. And it has been an extraordinary honor for me to serve as a member of Congress, to represent you statewide as Secretary of State, and to serve in our state Senate as a Republican and carry the conservative banner in this United States Senate race. We fought a good fight. We knew it was going to be tough going in uh, against an incumbent, but under the most trying of circumstances, in what has obviously been a very difficult year for me. But I will tell you on a personal note, there have been so many things that have been so hard, and so many of you have walked through that with me, and no one more than my husband, Anders. But for all of those obstacles and all the things that were so tough, uh, with the exception of losing my dad, there is not one single thing that I would re reverse the tide on because it has grown my character, it has grown my faith, and I've had the chance to meet some of the most remarkable people and solidify friendships that I've had over the years, more so than any other time in my life, and I would not turn back the hands of time for anything. So for that, I thank you. Well, that has been a, a pathetic campaign. I mean, uh, <laughs> the president wouldn't even let her stand up on the stage with him the other night. Yeah. And he came into the state, and she showed up, and he made her sit out in the gallery with everyone else. He didn't want, look at that, he didn't want, want to be seen next to her. She did get 38%, I think, in a bet I made with the Post. I think I said it was about 39. I'm a little <laughs> off there, uh -huh. but not much. Uh, why do you think Catherine Harris went through this year of taking a nomination that nobody wanted to give her? I think she decided that, that she was the story, and you heard in her concession, concession speech, me, 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 me. This was all about her ego, and I think that she couldn't let go of that. And she could have been a congresswoman for life forever. from that concern. Right. That very concern. Consider that, 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 that her decision to run and the party's inability to get her, get her not to run may have cost them the Senate. 
Do you well, think they no, could have put a no, no, forceful no. candidate Bill, I mean, Bill against Nelson Bill Nelson? Was Bill Nelson was beatable. Yeah. Hey, Bill, Bill Nelson, Nelson was Bill beatable. Nelson was beatable. No, I don't right know about that. that. Why are you? T- I don't I, know. I see that Ben Grin there. Did you think that she couldn't have held her house seat forever? No, absolutely, she could have. She absolutely could have. So she just threw it away. Well, she went on for higher office. There are a number of members of Congress who made the same decision. Look, she, hey, she made a president, you know. That, that makes you feel pretty so important. That makes you feel pretty Stop important it. when you can create Please. a president all of a sudden. There was you think, a lot well, of at least I should be in the Senate. There, were plenty of, uh, there was a lot of talent in Florida in the Republican Party who could have taken on Bill Nelson and made that a race, and I think beaten him. And maybe, even, maybe not in this particular year, but I do think Nelson was beatable. He, he, he did not have a real record with the public. I mean, it was, uh, he was kind of a non-entity in, in, in the public uh, in Florida. And I, I do think he was beatable. And, and this, this could have been, uh, they could have saved the Senate if they had found a better candidate in this race, someone who could have beaten Nelson. I think you're being argumentative. Yeah. Because <laughs> Bill Nelson is a moderate Democrat, an astronaut of sorts, uh, a likable fellow, kind of an old style Floridian. I, not a not any time he was Floridian. In a, in, he in had his a southern tough, accent, the whole thing. He never won a tough race when he ran for governor. Uh, he always only won no, no, you know, no brainers. Yeah, but he was—he was a popular guy, and Chris is right. There's just there, there wasn't going to be enough reason to um, beat him. And, and the um, uh, the Republican Party, you know, Jeb Bush hasn't pulled the Republican Party together. Who knows? With Charlie Crist and Bill Nelson, they're a nice. You know, I, I do think she uh, underused and didn't know how to exploit her her celebrity. If you want to call it notoriety, fine. But once you've got that night kind of name ID, once you're up there in the stars in terms of being somebody, look, there's 435 members of the House. There may not be 20 we've ever heard of yep. the public. She was one of them that everybody knew. She could have turned that into something, and she, she never seemed to be able to. Maybe people weren't fair to her, but I would have thought that she would have accounted to more than a 39% attempt at beating a guy who's a middleweight. Mm-hmm. She felt a certain entitlement to many things, and I think that that sort of came up short when you actually had to go out and campaign for votes and right, so put forward a, a coherent You do speak the for the populace. party establishment on this, don't you? I, I'm speaking <laughs> purely for myself No, I here, think you speak for the party establishment, which, which uh, shunned her. In the well, way I, 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 well I, believe, I believe the party establishment gave her some gentle hints and some advice that turned out to be pretty accurate. Well, yes. they, but they didn't put anybody else out there. That and, I, and I think that's right. didn't have a shirt. And they didn't put any resources. That's on Jeb Bush's head. Jeb yeah, Bush should have figured exactly this right. out. That's exactly right. This was Jeb Bush's it's, it's last. I'm impressed by it's, Florida. It's I think Florida, Florida, Florida is going to become increasingly influential in American political life. It's a big, big state. It's growing. It's a young person state. It's not just a retirement state by any means. It that's is right. going to be important economically, and it's going to be one of the real important states of this union. And it's not way out in California either. It's very close to the East Coast. It's in a position to influence uh, policy much more than California. We'll, well be right as, as back. As a Floridian, I vote for that. Oh, I really do believe I've been down there enough to feel it down there. Florida is a powerful state, and Jeb Bush may not be out of politics at this moment. We'll be back more with our panel and more of these concession speeches. My personal uh, preference is that we watch a lot more of those right now. We'll be right back. this race, we fought hard. We did everything we could do, but it just was not to be. This was not the year we could not win. We did everything we could. This was not the year we could not win. You know, you have to feel, I know DeWine, I, I met with a bunch of his people one time. It was a favorite of him. He called me and said, come eat with my people. And I, I do it for all these guys. They have their people from home. They come to them. They believe in them. Uh, they do it. They don't do things wrong. They just don't. Th- I don't care what anybody says. Some of these guys just—they're going out with the wave, just like Jim Talent, Mike DeWine. Yeah. These guys—I saw this all happen in the '70s with liberal Democratic senators, like Frank Moss, Gail McGee, Lee Metcalf, yeah. Magnuson, Frank Church, but- John Tunney, Montoya. Everybody Rich I Bond. knew yeah. out in those days all got beaten. They went out with that. Yeah. Liberal wave, I'm sorry, conservative wave, the mm-hmm. Sagebrush Rebellion, gone. Everybody goes. And there we're seeing it happening in the East and the Midwest to uh, the Republicans. Sherrod Brown just worked his butt off this campaign, though. He started two years ago and did not stop.
But the other important thing in Ohio, of course, is that they've elected a Democratic governor, which sets up in 2008 uh, a lot of other possibilities in, in, in terms of controlling the, the, the Democrats state. Democrats did a good <laughs> job of recruitment, and, yeah. and uh, that's, that's a big story out of this. Uh, they well, go through them. Go through well, the recruitment the recruits for the well, Senate. I, I, mean, I think it, you know, Sherrod Brown was a, a, a bit of a risk and a little out of the norm because of what they did is found, found a lot of centrist candidates around there. I mean, you heard McCaskill talking about that she's for the death penalty. You've got Webb. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they tried to find a, some, some candidates who didn't have traditional Political back, background in some cases. They really worked at trying to fit. Who's the, the day? The, Was it Chuck the, Schumer? Who? Rahm, I think Rahm Emanuel on the House side and Schumer on the well, Senate side. Well, let's go to the big names. Were, well, I am so impressed with this that. because I've seen yeah. they've never been so good at picking presidential candidates as right. they were picking yeah. senators. You got a guy More like uh, Jim Webb. If he wins, perfect. A military guy, Secretary yeah. of the Navy, military background, novelist, pretty smart guy. Never big friend of the Clintons, never big friend of uh, Chuck Robb even. A very independent guy, maybe a John mm -hmm. Glenn, even Democrat. Mm -hmm. You've got this guy, Tester, with the crew cut out there. Looks like he's driving a tractor. Looks like a regular guy. He doesn't look like some intellectual from the University of South Dakota, or like McGovern or somebody. Looks like a regular guy working, working out there like the other people. Mm -hmm. You've got... Uh, uh, What's pick. the other? Oh, you got. I'm trying to the other big one you picked. Well, pick um, another one where Chuck Schumer McCaskill's has to work really hard. McCaskill was a strong candidate. McCaskill mm -hmm. was a strong candidate. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, they said that, that she was the one woman they really mm -hmm. needed to win in that state. Uh, in Virginia, the three they got Rhode Island, you got this guy, Sheldon Whitehouse. Mm -hmm. He says every bit as waspy as the other guy and looks like he's, in the, he's a but classic he's a Yankee Englander. senator. Right, yeah. Classic case. I mean, uh, they they picked up Bobby is, Casey I mean, Jr., a pro-life, culturally the conservative. That's, that's the race. Schumer, Schumer is one of the most li soci socially liberal uh, Democrats in the okay. Senate, but he put that aside in recruiting these candidates. The Pennsylvania yeah, they were willing case, to I mean, sell their soul a little bit the, to get the, candidates the, in who would win, which will make the governance part of this kind of interesting. So that's you got to hand that to Chuck Schumer. That's also, Pennsylvania is, a, is the best <laughs> example of how, how hard Chuck Schumer has to work. I want to know how they rough up Bobby Casey Jr. The next Supreme Court fight they've got. I mean, Let's go right now to my friend uh, David Schuster. He's down by phone. I guess we've lost the camera. <laughs> We're operating on <laughs> limited budget now. But David, Excuse thank me. you for joining us. You're still down there in Richmond. What do you hear is happening in that Senate race? Well, Chris, a couple of things. Yeah, we lost the camera at 4.30 <laughs> in the morning, but um, no. And come daylight, uh, both uh, Jim Webb and George Allen are going to get a better at least picture of, uh, of where the votes may be that they could be missing. Uh, as it stands, the spread now is obviously around 10 or 11,000 votes, uh, Jim Webb with the lead. This is largely the result of absentee ballots that they continue to, uh, to count through the night. What's going to happen come daylight is both campaigns have lawyers that are going to go across the state and be part of what's known as a canvassing. And that's simply where they will double check and make sure that the arithmetic was accurate, that the tickers from the electronic voting machines were uh, accurate, that the right numbers were called into the Secretary of the State of the Board of the Elections. And they'll go through and essentially double check all of the numbers. Uh, by the end of the day, at that point, uh, the web campaign should have a better idea whether, in fact, there's potential for them to make up uh, the 10 or 11,000 votes. In other words, they may discover that there was a massive computer glitch or that numbers were added incorrectly or that for whatever reason votes were not counted. If that's the case, then obviously that increases the likelihood that once the election is certified 10 days from now, then the Allen campaign would say, yeah, we want to recount, knowing that there are some votes there that could make a big difference. On the other hand, if in this canvassing tomorrow it becomes clear that the official count uh, provided uh, last evening was accurate, that there wasn't some major computer glitch, uh, then it becomes sort of a whole new ball game. a question of, you know, can you figure out some way of making up 10,000 votes if it doesn't appear that those votes exist for you? Have there been any claims by the... Uh by the Allen campaign that there have been irregularities or failures to count accurately? No, the, uh, the Allen campaign now uh, is not sure. I mean, they're just saying, look, we just need to go back and do the canvassing that's warranted under state law and, uh, and go back and see. But there haven't been any accusations really on either side, uh, Chris, that there was either any major sort of computer glitch or that the math was done improperly or that there was some number that wasn't counted. There is one issue, though, that has come up with both campaigns, and that is apparently a large number of military absentee ballots were either never mailed to military bases or that people who are from Virginia who wanted to vote or were serving in the military, for whatever reason, they didn't get their ballots or they weren't faxed properly. So that's a whole Well, if you issue. haven't voted, you can't make a claim to have the right to subsequently vote, can you? 
Well, yes and no. Uh, you, you can't, but there's something called a provisional ballot, which, for example, at the polls, if you go to the polls, yes, you're but not they a, had to have uh, uh, had to have claimed those uh, provisional ballots on election day. You must vote on election day, right, or earlier. That's right. You must vote on election day. I think the issue is: is there some sort of issue with provisional ballots, say, um, at you know one of the military bases in Virginia? Remember, you're talking about you know you know I think 750,000 um, um, military veterans and and certainly a large number of active duty in Virginia. So there's some question about people who are in active duty military. How did they get their ballots in on election day if they did? Okay, David, I think I can say goodnight to you now, can I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can say goodnight, and we'll, we'll be back up in just a couple of hours. I think, I think we're, we're going to Morse code actually. next after the phones have failed. But anyway, thank you, David. <laughs> You're a great reporter. Here's a Thanks, look at some Chris. notable losers tonight. I'm going to read these boards. It's always brutal, but here we go. Late in the morning now. It's almost 5 o'clock now. Let's take a look at some of these losers. I'm looking down here. I can look up as well. Here they come. <laughs> I'm waiting. I'm, uh, I'm conscious. Here, what we do is we show these things. We call them cards. We've been showing them all night. I was watching these things when I was a kid. These are the things that tell you what happened. Here's, here's, I love this way it's done electronically. <laughs> In California, Arnold Schwarzenegger is a winner, clearly, against uh, Phil Angelides, the state treasurer. He clobbered the poor guy. Angelides is a good liberal guy, but no, has no star quality like this guy, obviously. You can blew him away. Well, that was an attempt to show you all the losers. We're going to have a, maybe we're, here they are right now. Let's take a look at the losers. No, 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 that's not us. I'm a victim of my, well, that wouldn't be acceptable, but I am a victim of my tools here. I have to tell you, I love election night. I'm a little tired now, but I have to tell you that uh, I, uh, I made a prediction in the Washington Post, which was sealed, and I don't mind saying what it was now, it was that the Democrats would pick up five seats in the Senate and they would f pick up 27 seats in the House. I must say I was, I was sort of chastened away from the bigger numbers uh, at the end of the week. I began to think, wait a minute, it's not going to be that big. Yeah. And yet uh, people like Chuck Todd were saying it's either going to be big or nothing. You can't play the game of coming out in the middle. Of course, I tried to play the game <laughs> of coming out in the middle because I thought a rational person would say it's like a two-thirds of a tsunami. It's not a full tsunami. And what we're watching tonight and this morning, rather, the morning after is what looks like a tsunami came through here. Yeah. Something really big, a real burp of anger against the establishment, which may be growing. This I election, if it's held next year, could I, be more. I could tell there was an earthquake. I wasn't sure there was a tsunami, and that, that, that we, we had that. I think part of what happened, you know, if you, if you continue the storm analogy, uh, growing up in Florida, hurricanes always lose strength as they approach shore, and I think over the weekend it, it might have dropped from a Category 5 to 4, but... Uh, once it hit shore, the levees broke. <laughs> All that jingling over the weekend did not hit too much. Let's take a look now at some of the losers to, uh, last night. Here they are. Bob Casey defeating Rick Santorum. Look at those numbers. They are astounding. For anybody who's watched wow. this election, with 99% of the vote, hold up that card. We thought this election would be maybe a 10-point 10, 10 spread, maybe 12. Look at this, 59 to 41, an 18-point spread. How many incumbents have ever been beaten, you know, really thumped like that? Bob Casey Jr. with well over two, two million votes. And let's take a look now at, at Rick Santorum's concession. Another thumping, 12-point thumping there in the Iowa Senate race. These are not close calls. Uh, a lot to do with economics. Let's take a look at Rick Santorum's uh, concession speech. It was really, I thought, I know you can be, I'll be accused of being too soft here, but I was caught with this. I cannot tell you what a privilege it's been, what a privilege it's been to serve this great commonwealth. I mean, we travel around, we, you know, we just did 19 counties here in the last five days, and the people in this state just are so resilient, they're so committed and strong, and, and you know, they're also pretty darn tough and opinionated. <laughs> and, uh, and that sometimes is a good thing, Today, not such a good thing. But I respect the people here. I love them. I thank you. And I mean this from all of us. You have blessed us with a gift. And I hope that you, at least in retrospect, think that we didn't just go and bury the gift. We took the gift that you gave us and we used it. We used it to try to do some great things for Pennsylvania and some great things for this country and even the world. Well, that's, of course, an allusion to the parable of the talents in the New Testament about 
the man who was given the talents and invested them wisely. There's Rick. He is the real thing, whatever your politics are. I think Rick Santorum is the real thing. He's a genuine conservative and one of the losers last night, a man who was headed towards the presidency, perhaps, the presidency, and ended up being just another guy that lost a re-election race. Here we have Sheldon Whitehouse defeating Lincoln Chafee handily on the, wish, on the issue of Iraq. Never has there been a clearer case. Lincoln Chafee would never have lost this race had there not been a strong, especially in New England, very strong wind against the war. It's the state in which uh, uh, President Bush enjoys his lowest performance rating among the people. The job approval of the President of the United States, George W. Bush, in the state of Rhode Island is 23 percent, and that's what Lincoln Chafee had to defend up there. Here we have Claire McCaskill defeating Jim Talent. Another vote that came in very late, the last one we couldn't announce here. We hope to announce more in the next couple of hours, but clearly, Claire McCaskill, a very delightful lady. She's so buoyant. She came through here. We just talked to her uh, on television. She's dramatically positive in her politics, I think. And so is Jim Talent, the person she beat, who has, in his defeat, continued to have a positive job approval in the state of Missouri. Here we have Bill Nelson. Uh, we argued about how strong opponent he would have been to a stronger challenger, but Katherine Harris did not pose much of a threat. She was mocked by the Republican establishment, uh, derided by the White House, shunned just the other day, yesterday, by the President of the United States in Pensacola. He wouldn't even let her come up on the platform. He made her stay down in the, uh, in the crowd with everyone else. Let's go right now to uh, the country where everything about this election is centered in Iraq. Richard Engel, you're one of my heroes. All day long and all Thank night you, long, we've been counting it. The reaction of the American people to the war in Iraq. What's the impact? What's the reaction there to the news? Iraqis are very much, Chris, trying to figure out what this means. There's been special call-in programs on Iraqi state television where people have been uh, been calling in, talking to government spokesp spokespeople, to analysts, asking exactly what does this mean? What impact, if any, will this have on policy here in Iraq? The American troop presence in particular has such a tremendous influence in the daily events in this country. Planes can't take off from Baghdad International Airport without American support, without American choppers giving them some, uh, some radar support. Iraqi police, as, as we did in a story last week for Nightly News, effectively cannot go out on patrol in, in, in very dangerous areas unless they have some American protection. So the, the government here, the Iraqi government, is very much dependent on American troops to move around. The prime minister can't go around the country without Americans helping to secure the roads. So any time there is discussion about major changes in American policy, it, uh, it, it certainly gets the attention of the Iraqi government and of the Iraqi people. People were uh, calling in on this program asking, is this the end? Is there going to be a new policy? Is the country going to be divided? And the, uh, the government spokesman was effectively trying to reassure them, saying, this is just a congressional election. It is not going to change dramatically policy in Iraq. But obviously, that is a, that is a major concern here. Even Al Jazeera, the, uh, the most influential Arabic language news channel, is having special programming at the end of this week asking that very question, is this the start of a new policy in Iraq? So it is uh, certainly on, the, uh, on the, uh, the airwaves here in the Middle East. I was impressed by the sophistication of the reporting by Al Jazeera. You mentioned uh, their reporting. Let me read to you from uh, the re report I'm getting here from Al Jazeera. The elections have been shaped by an unpopular war in Iraq, scandal at home, and dissatisfaction with George Bush, the president. So, I mean, we've been looking at all these foreign dispatches. They look like fairly accurate accounts of what happened here. All the reading we're getting is that people voted against the war in Iraq. They were voting against a sixth year of a presidential term, a presidential tenure, which tends to be negative in terms of uh, the attitude people have towards the president. And the word scandal uh, received an enormous prominence in the uh, polling, the exit polling, almost at the level of the Iraq war. So mm -hmm. I guess they're getting a good report over there, for better or worse, of what happened here, Rich. <clears throat> Well, it's different. In Iraq itself, people are trying to figure out what immediate impact it will have. There was all sorts of discussion uh, about would Iraq be divided into separate countries. That's something that people here do not want, but that was sent out on the table. There's been a lot of discussion on, on programs like yours in, in the campaign about very dramatic actions being taken in Iraq. 
uh, dividing the country for one, a major pullback of troops, setting deadlines. All of these are, uh, are decisions that, have, that are life and death consequences here. We're talking about dividing an entire nation. So Iraqis are, are very concerned. People here do generally want some sort of change of course. Uh, they would like, uh, obviously, more safety. They would like their government to, to do more, their own security forces to take a much more prominent role, and for American troops not to be as present on the streets, but uh, it is it is something that Iraqis are very concerned about. In the Arab world, a different kind of uh, debate, as you were talking about, the question on uh, on Al Arabiya and Al Jazeera, the the two main Arabic questions, is is this election going to be a turning point for the strategy? And they framed it even with a slightly more uh, opinionated bias, saying, is this an opportunity to change the strategy in Iraq? That was the question they were asking their viewers. Okay, Rich Engel over there in Baghdad. Thanks for that report on the aftermath of our presidential elections here at home. We'll all be right back after this break on MSNBC. We continue to cover Decision 2006, The Battleground. We're back. It's 4.48 and 36 seconds in the morning. I are here on the East Coast with an amazing election result coming in and still coming in right now. We're going to get more information in a couple minutes about what's happening in Montana. Of course, we're also happening, watching what's happening in Virginia because if those two states move the way they're moving, we're going to have a complete turnaround in the United States government with the U.S. Senate following the U.S. House of Representatives into the Democratic calm. What an amazing development. Very few pundits had it this big, but Pundits did see that it was headed in this direction. Nobody believed it would go this far. Let me bring in a friend of ours from Philadelphia, and that's Michael Smirconics, who's often on these airways, who got up earlier, even earlier than usual, to be with us today. Michael, I'm looking at the, uh, the results here. Not only did Rick Santorum lose and give a very magnanimous uh, concession speech with his family around, but also, look at these. Uh, we've got uh, Melissa Hart losing, according to Associated Press, losing in Pennsylvania to Altmaier. That's the first big Pennsylvania uh, Republican loss in the House of Representatives. Here's another one. Gerlach, uh, behind, but not a definitely loser. loser. Nobody's projecting him losing, but look, he is two points behind there. That means something with all these votes in. And we've got Kurt Weldon uh, declared a loser in that race by the Associated Press. Losing rather dramatically, 56 to 44. Not good for an incumbent of his standing in all those years. That's two losses so far, Hart and Weldon. <clears throat> no projection here in the Fitzpatrick race, which is dead even between the two Irish guys here. Uh, Murphy and Fitzpatrick, 125,000 votes apiece, basically. But there again, Murphy's ahead. The Democratic challenger is ahead. And here we have Carney beating uh, Sherwood up in Scranton. Uh, pretty dramatic there. So we've got three wins, three incumbents dumped already, Mike, and two up behind. This is amazing. The, of the five that were vulnerable, three are gone and two are in big trouble. Michael Smirconish. Hey, let me let me show it to you in the uh, newspaper of your old hometown. Sure. He haw says the Philadelphia Daily News this morning. Can you <laughs> can you get a look at that? What does that mean? <laughs> uh, Democratic wave says the Inquirer. By the way, Chris, you look good to me. I mean, I, I this is what time I get up. I'm on my way to work. Your coverage was great. I hung with you until about midnight. <laughs> I think that MSNBC did a fabulous job, and I'm the only guy among your panelists who sat in a barca lounger with the clicker last night and can tell you how you stacked up against all the other guys. The graphics were great. All the reports were great. The pundits were great. You did a hell of a job. Well, thank you. I knew I also had, uh, we had Dan Abrams, our, who runs this network. He came in here early tonight, and he said that we we're also ahead of every other network in, in announcing winners and losers, that we had the we had the fast track and with regard to reporting the, nor the stories last night, which is, when you get it right, the name of the game, you got to get them right, you got to get them early, but right first, and I think we did both last night. I think so as well. Listen, I, relative to what's going on in, in my neck of the woods, I said to you as the election was drawing near that I think I was feeling as the people in New Hampshire or in Iowa feel in presidential election time in that I was living in an area that could determine the outcome of the direction of the country. I'm shocked by the margin of the Santorum race. I'm not surprised that he was defeated, but I always
always believed that there was a hidden electorate for Rick Santorum, people who found it sort of unfashionable to tell a pollster. I know exactly end, what you mean. You know, and but in the end, that didn't turn out to be the case because Fast Eddie's margin is awfully similar to that which Rick Santorum lost by, meaning the gubernatorial race and the Senate race are only about two points behind. Those suburban congressional battles, if it turns out to be a total blowout of the GOP candidates, that'll be quite a surprise as well, because I thought that in suburban Philadelphia, in Bucks County, by way of example, that Fitzpatrick would hold on, as you point out, and I've seen those final numbers. It, sh it appears that he's still trailing. There's some, you know, some contesting of the ballots going on there, but by about 1,200 votes, and that Jim Gerlach may be at this point behind Lois Murphy, as you just reported. That's a real shock to me. You know, we were briefed here at NBC about two weeks ago when we had this amazing briefing from our top pollsters. It was Peter Hart and uh, Bill McIntyre. You know, it's amazing that I can tell you the results. I believe I'm covered now by any embargo or I'm not covered anymore. They seem to have this whole thing. This is a bipartisan uh, set of uh, pollsters, very well respected. They do the uh, Wall Street Journal NBC poll. And they had it. They said what was going on in the country, and it's reflected in Philadelphia. It isn't an all politics, it's local thing there. They said what's going on is all the unaffiliated voters, what we call the independents. And when we were growing up, I mean, when I was growing up, they were all Republicans who had given up on the Republican Party and said they were independents. Today, they were a mixed bag. But they all were talking like Democrats. These are the suburbanites, the people who live in those counties around big cities, who generally say not, they're not affiliated. They're, they, they spoke to the, po the pollsters on the issues of the war and other things, as if they were Democrats. And it turns out that this year they weren't really unaffiliated. The Republican base held to a large extent. The unaffiliated, the non-affiliated voter, the independent voted with the Democrats. And that's why you're seeing these big switches of power. And, and But I have to tell you, I am amazed, too, that it's almost a 20-point spread with regard to those races. Well, let me, let me tell you what I think is coming next, because I'm, I'm trying to focus on what the next step will be. I see a very important battle about to be waged for the direction of the Republican Party. And the issue, as I see it, is whether the evangelical Christian direction of this party, something that I'm personally uncomfortable with. I mean, where does it leave a guy like me? Not to be selfish, but I'm waking up this morning and I'm saying, you know, I've wanted a timetable in Iraq for a long, long time. I believe in embryonic stem cell research. I'm a pro-choice guy. Is this party big enough for me? I mean, is the direction as we head toward the presidential race now going to be? I can hear the voices of people saying we need to return to the party of Reagan. And I believe there's going to be a battle for that moderate wing of the party versus the more conservative forces who will say we need to return to our roots, even though I don't believe that's the case. That's what's to come for us. Well, that gets back to a point I've made uh, that I don't think Ronald Reagan would have taken us into Iraq. And this division in your party is over Iraq. It's not just over stem cell and some of these domestic issues. It's over that very unusual decision by a conservative administration to take us into a part of the world in the way that it did, in a, in a, in a war of our choosing, a war of the administration's choosing, and that I don't think Ronald Reagan or Barry Goldwater or George Bush Sr. would have ever done. And so didn't you know you're going to face a, a, a conflict with your base, with yourself over that issue? Well, I, I think that the, the more immediate bungling has been the, the, the total failure to articulate an exit strategy. You know, I had an interesting uh, interaction. Wasn't well, that just another way of saying we want to get out, we didn't want to go in, but we'd be happy no, enough to get out right not now? Not necessarily. I, I think it's a viewpoint that says we're, we're willing to hold on for a while, but tell us that there's some light at the end of the tunnel and, and tell us those circumstances by which we will be getting out. Three weeks ago, I had the opportunity to personally question Donald Rumsfeld on this issue. And I, we were in the Pentagon, and I said, well, Mr. Secretary, please tell me that somewhere in this building, there's a timetable for how we're going to exit Iraq. And his response to me was to say, well, somewhere in this building, there are projections. And a week later, there was that, con that press conference that involved General Casey, where they stood up and they tried to articulate the end game. And what happened? One day later, the Iraqi prime minister stood up and said, that's not a timetable that we're willing to live with. I mean, there was just never a recognition on the part of the administration that Americans need to know how's it all supposed to turn out, even in the best of circumstances. And I think we all lost our patience. Michael Smirconish in Philadelphia, please stay with us. We're going to go right now to NBC's Brooke Hart. Brooke. Good morning, Chris. Uh as, as you've been reporting, the new House Majority Leader is a Democrat, Nancy Pelosi, who has been directly uh, gone after by President Bush on the campaign trail, at least in the last few 
days and weeks as a San Francisco liberal. Well, last night she was among the Democrats who were celebrating uh, the fact that the House has now won at least 24 uh, Democratic seats, taking it over the edge, pushing Democrats into the majority there. Uh, Nancy Pelosi has has backed off her her initial um, warnings that about imp possible impeachment of President Bush. Lately, her language has changed so that she was talking more about accountability, not so much about oversight and strict hearings um, about how we got into the Iraq War and that sort of thing. Because uh, she, I think, had seen as many Democrats had that this was being used against Democrats on the campaign trail. In fact, she, she was being used as a way to warn Republicans and Democrats not to vote Democrat in this election because she would end up being the House Majority Leader. We're expecting to hear from her this morning, 11 a.m. She herself is expected to get a phone call from President Bush this morning congratulating her. But the fact of her, um, her. New role in the House as majority leader, it will complicate President Bush's agenda in the final two years uh, of his term. Because she is there, Democrats are in control. We have yet to see what will happen in the Senate. It hangs on these final two races, as you've been reporting in Montana and here across the Potomac in Virginia. That could be the last race we know about. We're expecting to know more about Montana within the next couple of hours. Uh, but as you saw last night, George Allen went to bed conceding nothing, and that could have been a lesson from the 2000 race. You remember that Al Gore came out and conceded the election, and that really put Democrats on, their, on the defense for the remainder of that recount fight. So nothing has been conceded, although Jim Webb maybe took a page from that 2000 election as well, claiming victory in the Virginia race. But we have yet to see the results there, and we might not know them for days. Uh, as AP is reporting, the spread now is 11,700 votes in Virginia. 11,000 is a critical number because under that, the loser can request a recount at state expense. Above that, any recount would have to be at George Allen's expense. We don't know whether he or the Republicans would pony up for that. Um, but at least it ha it's a symbolic benchmark because the public in Virginia and beyond might see that as it's sort of the state's threshold f under which it's not really, uh, uh, it is important to hold a recount, but over that, that it's not worth it to hold a recount. So we're going to find that out today as lawyers canvass these polling stations and find out exactly what that spread is in Virginia. But that could tip the balance one way or the other here on Capitol Hill, at least in terms of the Senate. Chris. Well, thanks to that early morning report, Brooke Hart on Capitol Hill. As you can see, there's the dome. What did he receive? All those new Democratic <laughs> Congress people. Let's go right now to Sheldon Gawiser, who's NBC, NBC's uh, Director of Elections. Thank you, Sheldon, for well, you've been up all night trying to figure this thing out. Can you give us a capsulization of what the When I return to Washington next week, I do so knowing that we have made a statement here tonight. And as all the political pundits may be correctly now, we're saying, why did you go out and talk about those unpopular things like the war? And I did. And I'm very proud. I, would, I do not rescind a word. Good evening. I'm Chris Matthews. It's now 3 a.m. on the East Coast. Democrats have had a big night. NBC now projects that they will have control of the House of Representatives by what looks to be a very comfortable margin. In the U.S. Senate, we're still waiting for a call in Montana and in Virginia. NBC News reports that those two races are too close to call at this point. Democrats need to win both of them, Virginia and Montana, to take control of the U.S. Senate. Now, let's take a look at the key races in the Senate that we've been able to call already. In Tennessee, uh, Bob Corker has won that race, according to our projections over Harold, Harold Ford, Jr. Claire McCaskill, we just interviewed her. She's the very happy winner against incumbent Jim Town, a man who really did nothing wrong except be a Republican in a very difficult year for Republicans. That's Claire McCaskill, projected winner in Missouri. An early winner tonight, that's Bobby Casey, Jr., the state treasurer who defeated the very strong and very impassioned Rick Santorum, who gave a great concession speech tonight. And in uh, the U.S. Senate race in Ohio, Sherrod Brown, Yale graduate, working guy, labor-type Democrat, questioning free trade. He won uh, the election tonight, according to our projections, for Mike DeWine. And then we've got 
Sheldon Whitehouse, who defeated the incumbent uh, Lincoln Chafee up in uh, Rhode Island, despite the fact that uh, Lincoln Chafee had broken with the president on the war. And we've got Ben Cardin, a Baltimore congressman, or as they say down there, a Balmer, Balmer congressman, who defeated uh, a very strong run by Michael Steele, the lieutenant governor. And there we have Bob Menendez, who really did suffer through some of the toughest advertisement I've ever seen, practically, up there in New Jersey to get elected in his own right to a seat he was appointed to by John Corzine, who went on to the governor. So let's take a look at the numbers right now. Oh, gosh. 49. The whole thing now, look at those numbers. And really the way it works is if the Democrats win two, they get 51. They've got 49. they got to win two. got to win Montana and Virginia, where they're both in very good position to do that. But when they do that, if they do that, they become the governing uh, majority in the United States Senate. And they will overcome um, the, uh, any attempt by the vice president to break a tie, which will not exist, in fact. Uh, you know, I'm trying to read these through uh, uh, some of Ben Ginsburg's papers here. The governor in Alaska has, uh, you know, we've got the Democrat has won that race. Probably... Uh, we got Jim Gibbons winning in Nevada, the governor. Governor's race there. And we've got... Uh, I, I'm not going to be able to read these cards, so we'll have to do this in a minute. The cards are well, way too far away from me right now. Let me go right now. Uh, you and I came down here and joined you guys. I lost the ability to see clearly what's going on in these races. You have a much inferior monitor down here, I must say. That guy's Butch Otter in Idaho. Okay, thank you. You want to read him your closer? Okay, I... Tony Knowles, probably in Alaska. Looks like he lost. Did he, did Tony Knowles lost to Helen 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 well, uh, Jim Webb is right now 7,800 votes ahead of George Allen. And uh, I've been in touch with the Democratic Senate Campaign Committee, and this is what's going on. It's a three-step process right now. There are still eight precincts left to count. Uh, six of those eight precincts, the Democrats are confident, are, are pro-Webb districts. So they think that after those precincts are counted, Webb is going to have an even larger lead. Tomorrow morning, the Secretary of State and Democratic and Republican Party officials go and they canvass uh, the existing precincts and verify that the votes took place. And then the third step is that the provisional ballots are counted. There's a, um, an unknown number of provisional ballots. Maybe Ben knows how many there are. But they know that where uh, most, the most ballots is, are in districts where they feel confident Webb is in the lead in Northern Virginia. So all in all, there's uh, several steps to take before George Allen even gets to demand a recount. Democrats are very confident that at that point their lead will grow even farther. What's your sense here, Ben, about the numbers? We just saw those numbers flashed on the screen about a 7,000 vote differential. That's a lot of votes to make up, isn't it? In a recount, it is. it's up to it 11,000 too. It's up. To, I think it is up to about 11,000. It is a lot of votes, whether it's seven or 11,000, to make up. Uh, the Allen uh, forces are banking on a large number of military absentee ballots that also have not been counted yet, uh, especially down in Virginia Beach, as well as the provisionals. Mm -hmm. But it is a matter, it is a matter of um, going through all those ballots and seeing what the universe is. Is this any cost to the candidate at this point? Is no. The canvas tomorrow is just the recounting of, not the recounting, I'm sorry, wrong term. It is a matter of looking at the statistics that are done, that were recorded tonight and being sure they're accurate because in the heat of battle, uh, late at night, sometimes numbers are switched around. They go back, they verify all the numbers, they retotal them. The Secretary of State then has 10 days to certify the results. Once the results are certified, then uh, the losing candidate uh, can request a recount if it's in, within a percent or if it is within a half of a percent, then it's an automatic recount. Do you have any sense, Pat, that this is going to go to a long fight or is it going to be a quick 24-hour? Uh, you know, a lot of these guys get up in the morning, they have a good night's sleep, and they look at the numbers like John Kerry did last right. time and say, I'm not going to fight this. Well, you know, I, I go with Ben. Look, if, I, if uh, George Allen gets up and they go back to these precincts and they come back in with 11, 12, 
13,000. Unless there's something dramatic, I would say that's it because, you know, changing a few votes isn't going to change yeah. that. I would say he would pack it in at that point. If you're down to 400, 300, then you'd go for one. Right. Do you realize what we've been through this weekend? I mean, I was asking Claire McCaska what it must have been like to be a candidate and to go through all these events, these little mm -hmm. welterweight events, the conviction of Saddam Hussein, which we all know was coming. It was not a news story. It was an right. event. It wasn't a news story. The John Kerry flub, uh, that story got a lot of attention, two or three days of it. Mm -hmm. And all those things hurt, it seems to me, the Democrats, mm -hmm. right? I'm not, I'm not sure that's true. Well, how not? I, I actually think that the Republicans made the same kind of mistake that I believe we made near the end of the 2004 campaign with the munitions dump in Iraq and decided to go after Kerry, I think, to consolidate the base, to find that, you know, they were sort of out of things to say, to be, and they believed their own, or drank their own Kool-Aid and believed that the way to win this thing was just to consolidate the base. But I think it brought the issue back to Iraq. Right. I think Saddam Hussein brought the issue back to Iraq. I don't think it was news that Saddam Hussein was in jail was being tried or was going to be executed. Well, the president so, brought the whole debate back to Iraq also in the yes, last yes, week and by talking that. about Cheney and Rumsfeld and the appointment <laughs> well, and by a statement. Is anyone ever so going to explain that one? The, that was part, well, yeah. why do you, you, you double your chips you, when you're losing the hand? It's why do you say, because, and not only am I keeping you believe in Rumsfeld, consistent I'm keeping Chris. Cheney. Like, but, but, who asked? But wait a minute, wait a minute. Look, I agree with your mistake on Rumsfeld, but Clearly, in the last week, it wasn't true that it was as close as the Pew poll, but it certainly did close. A lot of these races were a lot closer by the end of the week than we thought they were going to be, oh. and they're very close tonight. <laughs> Pat, you're grasping at straws. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah. if, if this is if this is closing, if this is closing, I'd like to see opening someday. Well, <laughs> well no, you know, the clearly it's a closer issue, though, race is than we thought it was going to be a week ago. The, the White House mm. never accepted the fact that if they talked about Iraq, that they would lose. And they kept doing it, and I think that that what's been said is right. That they just kept bringing the issue back to the to the place where they were the weakest, and the more it was discussed, the weaker they got. And so I think their, the race was closing a bit, and uh, you know I think that we're all a, a little surprised and excited that we went back to the yeah. sort of the. You know what I knew the, the Republicans were out of, out of ammunition, and they've been pretty good in campaigns the last couple of times. Going back to 2000 is when they jumped on that carry line as if this was the best thing they ever That's saw. It wasn't right. a big issue. They jumped on it, and they did not jump on what I think was a fantastic opportunity thrown their way before the weekend. Four days ago, or three, four days ago, there was a big story in the Washington Post. It was buried, but it was a big story, and it said the British intelligence had discovered that those people who were planning to blow up those planes over the Atlantic were planning to blow up those planes over American major cities. Why your team did not go right before the cameras and say, thanks to British intelligence, we were saved from a major American disaster in our major cities, and nobody lifted a finger. Where was Karl Rove blowing that opportunity? That's a lot bigger than the Kerry flub. Isn't it, Ben? <laughs> I mean, uh, the Biden Socratic would have man. taken the uh, issue the away from Iraq. This is reminding me it would have taken school. the issue right to terrorism when the president right. is strong. It would have been right back to 9-11. It would have been a great denouement of this campaign. And the president, and Carl, if you're watching, you blew it. You blew the chance to turn this campaign back to terrorism the last four days. Well, I, I think there was some conflict amongst the White House advisors on how to approach the whole final days of the campaign. And I think the president saying what he said was a surprise to many campaigns. It may have been part of the White House strategy. It was also a surprise when the president brought the focus back to Iraq. No, but there's something. Sorry, Excuse Pat. Go ahead. Oh, uh, listen. But, Chris, bring it forward just what you were saying over there. You got the Democrats are hiding behind Baker Hamilton right. Commission. President of the United States. They don't want a position. Yeah, but here's the thing. Now they got to take a position. The president's going to go out tomorrow morning and he's going to come up with whether you, whatever you say about Baker Hamilton, I'm the decider. I make the decision. Here's where I'm going. You take your stand. And the Democrats are going to have to now, because they do have power, maybe in both houses, they're going to have to take a stand. And they're going to come down and take three stands because they're divided three ways. Some are behind Bush. Some want a slow withdrawal, some want a cut. And that's what's going to happen. So they're all going to become hermit crabs and hide no, behind no, Jimmy Baker. Be, they're going to be split. Oh, they're going to try get, to hide behind Baker. But we Baker's get to not have elected. Fun. Nobody we elected get to have him. fun for a couple first, of years. First of, <laughs> first, of all, first of all, the worst advice that Pat's given the president, and I know he has the president's best interests at heart, 
is that he opened this press conference tomorrow by saying, "I am the decider." No, I, said, that's I don't what think he's I don't say. think that would I don't think that would be the the that's right what move he's to make. Say. Secondly, I agree with Pat, and I agree with what you've been saying, Chris. We you know, the Financial Times of London. I don't always read this, but I bought it this morning to make a point that the world press will look upon this a certain way. Here's the White House saying early today before the votes were counted, before the votes were cast. White House says result will not affect Iraq policy. Mm, right. Is that going to be what he says tomorrow? Exactly. If it is, it's a big mistake because they will affect Iraq policy. The truth of the matter is we've known since B I Vietnam, know. certainly, that you cannot conduct and sustain a war that lacks public but, support. But so you've got to build public support for an alternative us, policy. But tell us what but, Pelosi's going to do. I don't know what Pelosi's going to do, but if you're asking me, do I agree that Democrats no. ought to get out there with a clear and specific alternative, I certainly do. I've said it on this show over and over again. Uh, I've argued Iraq. about it with you, yes. On our right, we're going to have the panel stay with it. John Harwood, I just noticed you over there in the screenwriter's block, and I apologize, I was only informed Look at you all, all by yourself right there. We're going to start with John Harwood at length when we come back because I want to know, John's a great reporter, and I want to know what he thinks about the actual entrails of this victory of the Democrats. What is inside this victory? What will be read as the mandate when everybody looks at all the numbers and says, what did the public say? I thought it was very interesting that Ed Gillespie, very humbly, the former chairman of the Republican National Committee, saying, I want to study these numbers and figure out what the message is. That's what we need, a democracy that matters. We'll be right back with the panel. as Donnie the Democrat heads to his new job on Capitol Hill. Donnie the Democrat wins the election. That was the creation of our brilliant advertising department here. I love that ad. The, the, the elephant in bed screaming and in, in defeat. Interesting stuff. We have an alternative one to use on other occasions that we <laughs> both were available to us. John Harwood, the numbers tonight, as they go through them, as you've been going through them already, what will they say about what was behind this? Well, Chris, what I think is behind it, and I wanted to make this point a moment ago when you all were talking about the Kerry joke, I think we've got to step back and realize this election was a lot bigger than some botched joke by John Kerry. If you look in the last 50 years, there have been five times when a party lost 25 or more seats. We're talking about the second Eisenhower midterm, 1948. There was a major, 1958, there was a major economic recession. They lost 48 seats. 1966, after Johnson pushes through the Great Society, Democrats lost 47. The Watergate election of 74, Democrats picked up 48 seats. The Reagan recession of 82, and then the uh, Gingrich Revolution in 1994. Now we've got the Iraq War election of 2006. It's a big deal. It's a big public reaction. We've seen the numbers be stable all year long, and it's going to be very interesting to see what the president does. If he adopts a fighting stance, I'm the decider. They're not. Uh, I, I think he's taking a big risk there with the last two years of his presidency. Well, in those cases, uh, presidents did respond to the message. You know, the people are talking to the president. Uh, it's not just uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger that responds to campaigns. Uh, Johnson ended up uh, retiring. He ended up uh, hiring Clark Clifford to give him a new policy uh, in the way that maybe Jim Baker will become the new Clark Clifford, someone who, if not officially, will unofficially become the new advisor to the president. Do we know that George Bush is incapable of uh, modification? Well, I certainly well, think on domestic policy, there's a good chance that for legacy reasons, he's going to try to make some sort of accommodation on immigration, perhaps even on Social Security, parking the privatization proposal and doing something about the long-term solvency. But the real uh, crunch is going to come on Iraq because he plainly believes in what he's doing. Uh, the American people plainly don't agree with what he's doing, and they've elected a Congress now to, to uh, stand up and uh, speak for them. So how he resolves that is really going to be a big mystery. Well, let's imagine that the president had full, full authority to do whatever he felt, that he had no opposition. How long would he keep us in Iraq? Here, just, would listen, he keep Chris, us in there for the rest of his you term? You've got, he answered you got he answered an irresistible that. force here. And look, there's no doubt the American people expressed tonight its anti Iraq, it's anti-Bush, it's anti-Republican.
but he's not only committed to this war, his entire legacy is this war. If Iraq turns into another Vietnam and a debacle, he's got nothing. And he believes that, and he and Cheney believe they're on the right course. I cannot see the, how Congress breaks him, especially if they're a tripartite group led by Nancy Pelosi, for heaven's sakes. How do they break him? Well, first of all, the well, demonization of, right. of Nancy hey, Pelosi isn't going to take us anywhere. No, no, no. In this. They can do it with, with if they do get the Senate. We've seen how all it's right. done. You have high-level, very televised hearings in which you bring in Jim Baker, you bring in Lee Hamilton, you bring in generals, and you make the case the president's war policy is not effective. You build such a case against them that there is now the probability that the Congress will say no to funding. All and, right, and they cut off funding? At some point. Then oh. this, this, this thing goes down, Fran, and they cut off funding. Do you know what happened to the Democratic Party after they cut off funding for Saigon? They, well, they got elected. 30, Jimmy Carter was elected in the next election. It was after they got elected, after, when they did that in 74, Pike Commission, all that stuff. That finished the Democratic no, Party no, no, nationally. Well, I, I don't know what you're sure, talking about. In 1974, the in, in, in 1974, the Democrats picked up an enormous number of seats. Right. In 1976, Jimmy Carter got elected president. Mm -hmm. right. Look, what's going on out there, I think, is that deep down inside themselves, people have a sinking feeling that we're headed for the helicopters on the embassy roof. They don't want it to happen again. That's why they want an alternative policy. John, do you, do you subscribe to the notion that it's off base for the Democrats to begin to use the leverage of uh, the purse strings on the Hill? I think it would be politically risky for them to do that. And I think the, uh, the uh, more tough-minded, practical politicians like Rahm Emanuel, who was the architect of the House uh, Democratic campaign, do not want to go there right now. So uh, there will be some in the caucus who want to do that who want to try to cut off funding, but I think uh, that will be uh, a political risk that they'll be reluctant to take. You know, I was looking at the international really, press here. I just want to bring your attention to the international press here because I know that we get involved in little things like the carry joke and things like that. And here's the international press's reading on this election. And I thought it was this coming. It's not quite as blaring or as trumpeting as I thought. Here's the Financial Times of London. Uh, the long-anticipated wave of Democratic support, much of it seen as an anti-Iraq war, anti-White House, or anti-Congress vote. That's their interpretation. Uh -huh. Here it is, Agence France Press, the French news agency, said it was riding a ro the, the Democrats were riding a tide of anger toward President George W. Bush, the Iraq war, and the Republican scandals. And then Al Jazeera, not our friend necessarily in the world, the elections have been shaped by an unpopular war in Iraq, Scandal at home and dissatisfaction with George W. Bush. Fair accounts, but very clear and very simple. Right. And very right. simple. From the president's point of view, what precisely is the purpose, do you think, of him banging his head into a brick wall over Iraq? Let's, I, I think we ought to postulate that some statements that are made before an election will change in the policy All that right. comes after an election after you read the results. And you believe he's reading them? Absolutely. You, you he can not read policy. the results. What would Karl Rove do when he saw a defeat in his face? Has he ever seen one, and what did he do in response? I think, I think that, that, well, first of all, Karl Rove has lost races when he was in Texas, and he learned from that. Mm -hmm. But right now, Karl's mm -hmm. mission is not elections. Karl's mm -hmm. mission is helping and saving the Bush presidency and creating and a legacy. this has been set Let up me finish. Let me finish. You have to take that into account. When you, if you give an honest assessment to where this administration is going to go in the next two years. Do the Democrats want to help the president have a good finale, Hillary Rosen? Well, Do I, you people, uh, Democrats, want to help the, a smart get goodbye for the president? A good tier, Ronald Reagan had a great last two years. Uh, can, would you want to help I, or do you I, want to, would you I, want to dance on his I'm grave? I'm absolutely convinced that when it comes to the war in Iraq, that, that, that Nancy Pelosi and, and her colleagues are serious about working out this um, issue in a bipartisan way. And, and I think that the White House has, has set this up for themselves in a way that, that allows them this exit. They, they had these meetings with the generals in the White House the weeks before the election. They talked about, we're not staying the course, we're looking at strategies and tactics constantly. So they've signaled that they're willing to do that. Then we have the Baker Commission. Jim Baker, a good friend. They've allowed themselves a to be... A good friend of whom? A good friend of the president, sorry. Oh, is he? I'm not is so he? sure about well, you know, that. Well, he's been there quite frequently over the last couple well, of months. We if know. You, if you don't want to deal so, with the friendship but, issue, they've worked together in the past okay. quite effectively. And, and he's got credibility on okay. these issues. Stealing and Florida. other members of his... <laughs> Commission have credibility but on these issues. Credibility, but the so president has got, responsibility. You've got a Republican. 
le a, a Republican-led um, uh, effort to change yeah, I, strategy that Democrats can help that's get That's all there, but look, let's get down to the bottom line. Are we going to lose? Because we are about to lose a war if you march out of there, and the president believes that, no matter if he lost the Senate and the House, is he going to collaborate in something he believes it's going to end in that? I mean, did Lincoln change his policies because he had a bad election in 1862? Are we experiencing <laughs> victory right now? No, we're not. Okay, what do you call what defeat? What is losing me? I, look, I think right Lincoln, now this Lincoln. war is on such a course that we are in the process. If we're, we're not winning it, and we may be losing it, I agree with that. But you're telling me the president's going to look at some election returns and adopt a policy he thinks is going to terminate his legacy and end a war in disaster that he took us into? Pat, I don't you're know. Pat, Pat, your I analogy think is wrong. They've already decided that it's a disaster. You're Their own generals have told them it's uh, a disaster. But, but, but so only because, because previous have presidents something. have made that but. decision. Harry Truman decided to hang it up in 52 in the spring and after decided he couldn't proceed, he couldn't prosecute that war after, after losing the primaries. After, after losing to Keith Harper in the primaries, he realized he couldn't prosecute the war. Lyndon Johnson realized he could not prosecute a war he had inherited. He Jimmy won, Carter did not. After, Jimmy Carter did fight he did the it the end. after New Hampshire, Chris. Right. Well, Why wait, do you, but wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh. The analogy here is wrong. Abraham Lincoln did not suffer a setback in the election of 1864. Mm -hmm. He got reelected president of the United 62. States. 1864 62. was tough, and 1864 was saved when Atlanta fell. Okay. But the analogy is flawed 62. for another reason. <laughs> this was a war of choice. This was not a war to keep the country together. By the together. way, let's not pretend you were on Lincoln's side in that war. <laughs> we'll be right back with more. Pat, you were back with Stonewall and the other Scots Irish <laughs> on that other side. Anyway, I love the way you. Presumed to be with the Army of the Republic. I will be right back. We're going to have uh, Chuck Todd with us to go through some of the analysis when we come back. And also, we're waiting on Montana. With our panel, but I want to start with Chuck Todd, who's been, as I said before, the man who's taught me so much during this campaign. As a credit to you, Chuck Todd, you said to me for weeks that if it's going to be big, it's going to be big. Nothing in the middle. It looks like it's big. Where are you pegging it right now for the House seats Democrats will control after all the counting? Well, uh, it looks like they're, I mean, I, you know, look, the NBC uh, estimate is as good as anybody's out there, particularly when you've got uh, the good folks at the Cook Report helping with it as well. So, 235 feels right. You know, we're going to have a runoff in Texas uh, in December. You know, this campaign will never end. You forget the recount in Virginia. Actual, there, there's going to be a crazy runoff in Texas, a runoff in Louisiana. So the number is going to fluctuate somewhere between 234, 235, 236. And there will be about five or six House recounts. I've talked with some folks over at the NRCC and some others. And, and there's going to be a few, a few recounts, which could fluctuate the number. But uh, this 235, 236 number appears what it is, which is a larger majority than the Republicans ever had since 94. Now, does that correspond to a six Senate seat pickup by the Dems? Is this about in the same proportion? I feel like it is. I mean, I think you had anything with that was going to be north of 30 meant wave, and wave, you know, the House and Senate moved together. And, you know, it is interesting. These last uh, Senate races seem to have tipped. It's as if the tipping point, whatever it was, moved it uh, in the same direction. You know, whatever undecided voter, they were all moving in the same direction, not by a lot, clearly, in Virginia or, or even in Montana. One thing I wanted to uh, bring up is uh, in Missouri, you know, President Bush might be getting the blame of that one squarely. I had talked to some consultants on the Republican side of that campaign, and, you know, President Bush made a late trip to Missouri, the only swing state he showed up to in a Senate race in this last week. And there it were a hurt. lot of, yeah, I said, absolutely hurt. There were a ton of Republicans who were begging the campaign to tell the White House no. And for whatever reason, somebody in the campaign agreed to do it. They couldn't tell the White House no. I have to tell you, a margin like you saw in Missouri, you have to wonder if that will, you know, look, when, when the margins are this small, everybody's, everybody, you can blame everybody and everybody's going to take credit, right? Do you have a sense that the, uh the box this campaign came in, which is really marked Iraq, was defined months ago. I mean, if you look at the, pen, the, the uh, pattern of the president's approval rating, you really can put it up at almost a 45-degree angle coming down uh, from the 60s to the 50s to the 40s to the 30s. 
over the past four years. He has consistently dropped in public approval for his job he's doing, largely because of Iraq. And it was just a question of where the jiggle was going to be up or down at the point we passed through the election. In other words, I'm asking you, was the main number element of this campaign, the roughly 30-some seats, the roughly six seats, uh, defined by the trend of the last five years? Absolutely. I mean, this was for, I mean, this election was about Iraq, and this was framed, it's no secret. Uh, everybody saw it coming for a year. You know, a lot of people were preparing for it. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of surprising. The other, the other thing about this election that I think we'll always remember, and like I said, a pollster told me this last week, and I, I fully buy into it, this is an election that was uh, about independence. What happened? Base Republican turnout wasn't bad. You know, they held a bunch of House seats in Ohio, Chris. We thought Ohio was going to be a killing fields, and they actually only lost one House seat there. So the base showed up. Independents showed up, too, and they voted overwhelmingly Democrat. And that's a, boy, that'll be interesting to see how Pat's part of the Republican Party uh, deals with that. Because, you know, any time a political party gets shellacked, there's always the intra-party feud and the blame game, and while a lot of people rightfully blame Bush, there'll also be a lot of those on the conservative side who will say, oh, guys, we just weren't conservative enough. Uh, oh, no. I've heard that saw all my life uh, from left I, and right. It's, it's so the oldest true. argument in the world. The neocons say, <laughs> right. if only we had more troops, we would have been right. The old liberals used to say, if we only ran a bigger deficit, we'd have fewer jobs. Mm -hmm. I've never heard an ideologue in my whole life say, I'm wrong in principle. But don't they always, <laughs> when you're in the minority, those guys always win the fight. Watch these leadership elections in the House, hey, right. and they're going to go right. Okay, They'll Chuck, I just want a definitional question from you. Tim Russell earlier tonight had a, he sometimes amazes me with his deaf sense of reality. He said, I said, it used to be, growing up in the 50s and 60s, that a independent was a former Republican, sort of a highbrow <laughs> suburbanite who just didn't like the Republican Party anymore, you know, a bit more fine than the party. Now, he said, I said, who's an independent now? He said, it's a former Republican who became, I'm sorry, it's a former Democrat who became a Republican who's now an independent. In other words, a Reagan Democrat became a Reagan Republican and now is an independent. Is that your sense of what an independent is? And I'd argue they're libertarian. Uh, the, these are folks that are somewhat secular. They're not interested in the social issues. They're, you know, they're not crazy about government. Uh, but they're they Ross want Perot people. Yeah, they want competent. They want competent government. They don't want big government. Uh, and they clearly, after watching what Katrina did, they don't want. No, they don't want. They don't want to get rid of government. They just want competent government. And I think the Republican Party has lost that libertarian. Look at what you know the growth that the Democratic Party is experiencing out west, and that's where you see. And, and boy, that was the heart of the Goldwater Reagan. Uh, republicanism that sort of grew out of the West. It was built on the backs of these libertarians, and I think now they're, uh, they've lost them, and they actually are flirting with the Democrats, which is something even five years ago I don't think anybody would have imagined. As long as the Democrats let them keep their guns. Right, that, that's right. Let them keep their guns, and let's not talk about the social issues. You watch. This Congress won't have a, an abortion bill. I, I, I really believe that Nancy Pelosi and, and Harry Reid won't introduce some sort of abortion bill or something like that where the Congre a Democratic Congress of 12 years ago, all they would have voted on is gun control and abortion. By the way, they don't call it abortion. They call it choice. Choice. My apologies. Okay, I know. I'm going to get lectured at. That's what they call it. Thank you very much, Chuck Todd, my guru. He's been right <laughs> all this great. campaign. Do you have any thoughts on that, John Harwood? It seems like a like Chuck Todd has done this thing really well. I mean, he's understood it was going to be of a large dimension. It wouldn't be a middle grade thing. It would be all or nothing. And he was really saying it was going to be all. He's certainly right about that. Certainly right that the collapse of Republicans among independents is what doomed him in this campaign. I just wanted to add what Chuck said about the whole issue of the Bush visit to Missouri. Democrats uh, in Montana tell me that uh, John Tester ultimately got a boost from the fact that the president went out uh, to campaign for Conrad Burns, that there was an initial blip for Burns, but then Democrats remembered why they were rallying in this campaign in the first place. I was in Missouri last week, asked Talent, why are you campaigning with Bush on Friday? And what he said was, look, I'm well known in the state. He's not going to bleed over onto me. What he's going to do is bring his megaphone and help me get my message out. Maybe it didn't work out that way. Who was that guy in the movies about Vegas? William H. Macy played the cooler. He would come over and stand next to somebody that was gambling and they'd automatically lose. <laughs> and they paid him. The, the, the casino joins, the gambling joins, paid this guy to walk around and have everybody lose. He stood next to. Uh, could that be the president? Well, it's the... The cooler. Look, look, defeat, or typhoid Mary, if you defeat, prefer that defeat metaphor. Defeat is an orphan, you know, and clearly now everybody's piling on the president of the United States, but... Are, 
uh, you know, a transfer of a few votes, and they could have won these three seats. I will say this. This morning I ran into... But it's into, a pattern. They all, they I, all but, look like they're going I, the know, same direction. In, but I ran into Carville. Uh, Carville and Novak, let me say this. Carville this morning was dead on. He said, I think it's going to be 37 because he did this 50... 50 congressional seats. Novak was dead on this issue. But Novak, Novak, Novak was, was wrong. He said, 19, wrong. he said 19 and 2 in the That's Senate. Right. And, and, of course, he'd been out there to these and various And he was places. saying that, that Conrad Burns was going to win and all this yeah, stuff. Yeah, that's exactly right. But look, Because uh, all Bob slight... cares about is the tax rate issue. No, it's all he ever it's cares not that. about. He's a good reporter. The thing was the, the wave was slightly higher. And it went over there and, and sent these three or four seats right over into the Democratic Congress. I, I think you all are underestimating something, though. And, and, and this gets to where Chuck was talking about in terms of the numbers. For months now, this campaign has been shifting towards the Democrats. But this time, the Republicans thought that they were going to be saved by their superior ground operation. Mm -hmm. what, that ground operation that helped them in 2004, that pulled it out even though polls were showing the country mm -hmm. breaking for Kerry, that ground operation in key states took it all the way for, for the president. The Democrats matched the Republicans this time almost dollar for dollar in key states. Uh, uh, and we cannot underestimate that strategy. And, in a, and, and in a wave, field. you can't have it both ways. If no. it's a wave election, exactly. the ground game does not really become the determinant factor. Mm -hmm. Ground games get you two to three points on the margins, but they are they are not. What kind of a ground game in, did he throw? Multiple sure numbers of these. So did he throw or did he go to the rush? <laughs> he had a better one than metaphors. he did. He had a better one than he did when oh, no, he was no. running you, when he was quarterback <laughs> in Tennessee. I'm sorry. In Missouri? <laughs> I think that, so. In Missouri? Sure, sure. North Carolina. Sure. There, no, there I'm were saying. Races. There, there were, were, there, were individual there, races there were individual where celebrity races, or other right. things were, didn't matter. Were, but you look at Missouri, you look at Ohio, you look but, at Virginia, where there was no ground game for Allen and where they, the Democrats have been spending millions since we took back the governor's seat two years ago. That, that investment has paid off this but election. But look at Ohio. I mean, apparently, what do we hear? One seat, yes. a congressional seat lost in Ohio. That was supposed to be the huge killing field. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't. Well, Pat, the ground Pat, game must have worked to some extent. Pat, there were huge killing fields in other places. Yeah, there was sure. a wave. As John Harwood points out, as John Harwood points out, this will be a bigger Democratic majority than the Republicans have ever enjoyed since 1994. They've never had this kind of majority. Besides, mm -hmm. Winning, actually winning a Democratic seat in, the, in, in Ohio, right. one seat. Is actually there are a big two thing. myths, Chris. That now I we've think... won the governors, it, the Senate, finish, and the House. There are two myths that I think are destroyed by this. The first is that you can reapportion the Congress so that no matter how strongly people feel, they can't change it. We've now seen that that's not true, right. yeah. and you can overcome partisan advantages in these districts. Number two, the 72 hour plan, part PR, spin, part reality, might be worth a point or two. It can't change the world when the world is moving in one direction. But Chris, let me give you a, uh, also, hey, look, though, what happened? Six percent of the Senate changed hands and seven percent of the House. <laughs> when we still, when we saw figures earlier that looked like if you'd had everybody district evenly, you would have won 100 seats. We're so still, they, it did change it, but it's not that dramatic in terms of numbers. It's enormous in terms of power. With both houses, but a what a thirty-five. It's of, a de seat? It's of the dimensions but of major 66. electoral changes right. and shifts. But I was in the sixty-six campaign. It would have been a hundred seats. I, I agree with that. Well, but we're I'm just saying hearing that. the recount is going on in Montana. It's going to take a while to get the results. They do expect to have it this morning. The final recount. They're going to already starting to recount some of the votes out there by hand. Uh, that How race close were. Is it? Well, we're looking at it here, 142,000, 136,000. It's a small Six state, obviously. There's a lot Montana. of votes in that state. Well, that's 6,000 votes separating them. And it's, it's a test to the challenge of the Democrat doing well out there right now. Uh, but uh, Conrad Burge just told supporters, a, a representative of the Senate just told supporters that they don't expect to have the final results in that race until sometime between 5 and 7 Mountain Time. Mm -hmm. That's about 7 o'clock here. But that's, uh, we're going to get more progress toward that. We may have a result faster than that because we're looking right now at uh, something of a divide between the two candidates, and it's favoring John Tester. Of course, we've learned so much in the last few hours. Virginia looks, at least we've got Jim Webb claiming victory there, somewhat out of order because the other guy has not mm -hmm. conceded. Uh, but we're going to have something of a decision made by, it looks like, are we all agreeing that the, uh, mm -hmm. that the, uh, the George Allen campaign will have to decide whether it's worth, con worth contesting it mm -hmm. and litigating this or just accepting the result and taking the loss? 
And, of course, uh, Missouri has been decided. We've got mm -hmm. a, that guy, John, we've got to talk to Jim Talent. There's a class act. Mm -hmm. No reason for him to lose except the tsunami. He lost against the wave. It just went down. Well, there was one reason for him to lose. What? He was yeah. a down-the-line supporter right, right. of the president on Which Iraq. Which normally and he got in pushed, Missouri would have been fine. And he got pushed. He got pushed to oppose stem cell research, yeah. which I think hurt him badly in the race. Have you no shame? Give the guy a break. He just lost. He's not, he didn't do anything wrong. He didn't do anything weird like Santorum has done over the years. Right? I, no, I, listen, I think he did a lot of the same weird things Santorum like did. Like what? Down the line oh, for no. the president on Iraq, he, exploiting the issue of what's called partial birth abortion. I've been interviewing that guy for weeks. He is the Talent straightest arrow over. I have seen in this business, Jim Talent. I just think he's wrong on the issues. That's true. Not that only may that, be true by your, by your lights, but it's yeah. not by, that's not an objective statement. Anyway, we're going to stay here, <laughs> and we're going to try to figure out more as we learn more from Montana. This is an interesting night. We're going to know in the next couple hours how large, in fact, the Democrat advantage is in the House of Representatives. We've got a wide swing still potential there, but it looks like they've definitely got the 218. They need to run the place. It's a question of how well will they get with, uh, with the inevitable, the inimitable Tom DeLay calls a lame duck majority that he can already croak, which seems to be his goal on the sidelines, or will they have an impregnable majority they can rule from? And will they, in fact, end up this Wednesday morning, we're already in, as the leaders of both houses of Congress. In fact, they'll leave Dick Cheney just to sit up there with nothing to do he can go because to an he won't be able to break ties because there won't be any ties, Mr. <laughs> Vice President. You'll be a much more time for hunting, sir, after this. We'll be right back with our panel. Let's take a look at the governor's races and see some of the big ones that have been decided tonight. We're looking at now uh, California, a big comeback from a year ago for Arnold Schwarzenegger. He is uh, the king of the roost out there right now, a man who's moved to the center politically and effectively won a big mandate. Elliot Spitzer, perhaps the next Teddy Roosevelt, this time coming out of the uh, Democratic Party, a real trust buster, reformer, loves to go to, board, go to court, go to battle, taking on business. It'll be interesting to watch how aggressive he gets once he's in that chair. Marty O'Malley, he doesn't like we call him Marty. He says, nobody calls me Marty except you. Martin O'Malley, the mayor of Baltimore, now the governor of Maryland, taking on Ehrlich, the incumbent who was very popular. Ehrlich had a plus 50 uh, performance rating from the public. Another example of a guy like uh, Jim Town, popular but lost. Governor uh, Ted Strickland won the governor's race against Ken uh, uh, Blackwell, a friend of uh, Bob Trump's. Blackwell was, of course, just like Catherine, ha Catherine Hepburn. Catherine Harris was in Florida, the recount person in the last election for president, and took a lot of heat from the liberals and the Democrats and the critics for uh, a race that wasn't quite clear how it was run. That's uh, Ted Strickland in Ohio. There he is, Charlie Crist. I just moderated that debate down there. I thought he did well. The public gave him a lot of shots for how he answered my questions. But look, there he is, the winner, a very, very likable guy, Charlie Crist, who's uh, running, and successfully so, and uh, elected in the tradition of uh, Jeb Bush, who's extremely popular down in Florida. Extremely popular. The Massachusetts Deval Patrick, an African-American guy, grew up in the streets of Chicago in the projects. Harvard grad, Harvard law grad, what a figure he is the next governor of Massachusetts. Well, she's been called a cover girl by uh, David Broder, the dean of, Wa of Washington Reporters. She certainly is. Uh, Jennifer Granholm reelected uh, in a race where a lot of people thought she wasn't going to do well, but she won big after uh, sustaining what looked like a, a tough period there early in the year. Chet Culver, son of John Culver, who was a buddy of a, what was he, roommate or something with uh, one Kennedy. of the Kennedys, Ted, Ted Kennedy, Kennedy yeah. a pal of his from Harvard, Chet Culver. I like the uh, governor now out in Iowa. Rob Blagojevich, a former congressman from Illinois, uh, from Rostenkowski's district, I believe. He elected governor again in Illinois, and he had a questionable period there where it didn't look like it. Mm -hmm. I think the cheap gas prices of the last couple months, the market going up, the economy looking good has helped all these governors. Here's a great guy, Bill Richardson. I just happen to like this guy. Uh, governor of New Mexico ran a lot of really funny ads about being a cowpoke. <laughs> may well be a vice president or a presidential candidate. We're looking right now. There's the governors, Democratic governors, now 28 of them. There were, well, yesterday, in fact, still are 28 
Republicans, but when come January, there'll be 28 governors as opposed to 22 Republicans. I wonder, John Harwood, what do you make of this? Let's, I mean, what do you make of that, the fact that we now have a preponderance of uh, Democratic governors, uh, especially now in the East, uh, in, uh, in New York, et cetera? What do you make of this? Uh, Michigan, Chicago, Illinois, rather. A lot of big state um, states now ruled by Democrats. Partly it's the nature of the year. Partly it's the uh, seats that came up uh, in blue states. Uh, look in particular what happened in Maryland. Ken Melman, the Republican chairman, had high hopes of holding that seat with Bob Ehrlich. Didn't work out that way. There simply was too much of an undertow taking him down. But you've still, of course, got uh, Republicans running the three biggest states in the country, Florida, Texas, and uh, California. There you have it. Maryland, the governor defeated on the issue of Iraq. What an irony that is, a questionable decision. But clearly he was part of that undertow, as you put it. People don't like this war. They're mad at the president who started it, mad at the president who's defended it. In the Senate, by the way, we're still waiting on Montana, which is still, still up in the air right now. We're trying to find out. We're going to have a reporter there. Um, who are we going to? I'm, I'm reading the prompter. Somebody just told me to read the prompter, and I've been trying to, which is still too close to call between John Tester and uh, Brian Rodriguez right now from Beartooth NBC, KT. V, V H out in Helena. Let me ask you, Brian, how's it look right now? Are we going to get a clear result in the next couple hours? Well, they're saying that they're going to be looking at about 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock here in the mountain time. So uh, right now we see that there are about five counties that are left to be counted, Cascade, Flathead, Silver Bowl, Galton, and Yellowstone. Yellowstone is recounting because they say that they had malfunctioning with their equipment, with their machines, not because of the questioning of, of the votes, but um, what the uh, Yellowstone um, campaign or Yellowstone officials have told the tester campaign is that, that the votes shouldn't change. So they're expecting to keep Yellowstone, which means that they are confident, they say, uh, for taking this race. Well, what's going to happen? Well, right now we, uh, we see that they have about a 7,200 uh, uh, voter margin right now, and they think that they're going to be able to keep it. So right now, I mean, from what they're telling me is that they're telling me that they're probably going to take this race. Is uh, there going to be any kind of recount situation developing out there? Is this going to be clear as it, as it seems right now? A substantial majority given the size of the state? Well, right now they're saying that the only way that they'd have it be able to be taken to court is that if the, if the 7,200 uh, margin goes down to 900, which they don't expect to do because right now they're thinking that they're going to take about three out of the five counties. So 900 would be the decisive point at which there would be a recount. Right now, it, what they need to do is they need to take at least two, or they have to need to take at least three of the five counties in order to win. God, this is amazing, Ari. Thank you very much, Brian Rodriguez, out there in Helena, Montana. Guys, I didn't think it was that clear. Yeah. Now it looks like the Democrats are going to possibly get. I mean, it looks like they're going to get the six. That's right. Yeah, I agree. It's going to happen. <laughs> it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Yeah. Well, we don't know it's absolutely it's going to happen, but we know about 90 percent now that it's going to happen. Uh, and I think you could see it coming. I think it was, I think it was felt in the in the wave that was building across the country. And I think in some ways there was more help for some of these congressmen or congress members who were in danger than there was for some of these Senate candidates. I agree with John Harwood. It was not a good idea for the president to go to Montana and Missouri. I don't think that helped those candidates. But the president was trying to be very clear in delineating where he could help. If you looked at that itinerary the last couple of days before the election, the president was very carefully going to a number of states besides these two, in all fairness. He didn't just go and make a mistake in a couple of places. He was going to places like Pens Pensacola, where we helped the Vern Buchanan win. And that worked out. Kansas, that worked for, out. Kansas for Jim Ryan. It, it, <laughs> well, you're being sarcastic, but the fact is he did succeed in, in plotting what looked like the minimalist campaign he had to run. Can you imagine if the president stayed in the White House the last week? They were trying to be surgical. They were trying to be surgical in where they went, whether it worked or not, because the wave was so big. They went to Pensacola, even although Charlie Crist was in Tampa and Orlando and Jacksonville. There was a reason for that, because they were trying to appeal to the base to get the base. This wasn't out. the president's travel schedule. I mean, in all, in all fairness to the president, um, the, these candidates were ahead for for several weeks beforehand, and and um, so I'm not sure that his trip there made right, a difference. Look, they, it, they were ahead. What they did was they stayed ahead. His trip didn't help, right. uh, and, and I think that's the key. But issue. this up on Bush night here, and look, I just, I've never I just known I've out. never known a president a in my lifetime who has, on behalf of the party, put himself at risk in 2002 and 2006. 
going up against bad odds, going night and day and worked his head off and worked his heart out, and he got whipped, and they got whipped badly, no doubt about it, but you cannot fault the man for fighting the way he's fought for his party. I mean, I have, I find it very impressive. No president I ever worked with did as much or longer or harder than George W. Bush. But, okay, he got but beat. But only because they were willing to plan his terms for as long as they did. What he didn't help his party with is the more substantial issue, which is he didn't listen when Republican members were coming to him privately saying, okay. this isn't working oh, out in their act. This, this was a broader institutional problem than just the president. Okay. There were to be sure. I have to thank, uh, I'm sorry, Ben. Stay with, stay with me for a minute. Brilliance will be with I you I have for to two thank hours. Patrick J. Buchanan, sir. Thank you. Sometimes I think you are, you are conflicted. You like the you like the battler. You like the president as battler. You don't like his neoconservative friends. You don't like his policies, but you like the character of a man who will fight when it's hopeless. Well, yeah, sure. He That's went right. out and fought. Well, I got left. Took my microphone off there, Chris. But he went out and fought for his party right, right to the end. Bob Shrum, you're giggling. You're happy. You're going to go to bed. You're going to put I'm that happy. head on the pillow tonight. Absolutely giggling. No, no. I'm going to put my I'm going to put my head down and hope that John Tester wins in Montana, that the 90% certainty becomes 100% reality. Will Hillary Clinton be majority leader? No. Harry Reid will be. That's right. John Harwood, thank you, sir, for being over there. We'll be called, or someone once nicknamed the screenwriter's uh, booth. Uh, do you want to have a final thought about this race? Will Hillary Clinton, coming back to a point I love, choose leadership in the Senate rather than a risky campaign for president? She may not run for president, but she's not running for majority leader right now. The one other thing I wanted to say, Chris, is there's some members of the House on the Republican side who are angry at those colleagues of theirs who decided to seek higher office this year in this unfavorable environment. Republicans lost those seats, and I talked to one member a little while ago who said, I hope all those guys who ran for governor and lost have trust funds because there are not nearly <laughs> as many K Street lobbying jobs for Republicans under the Democratic <laughs> Congress. Aren't are you now. tough? Well, don't they have still have the K Street project? Oh, I'm sorry, that was run by well, Santorum. Lost that. Anyway, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, John Harden, and everyone else. We'll be right back with what remains of the panel. <laughs>